Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Northampton's planning board meeting on Thursday, March 10th, 2022. As all of you have seen, this meeting is being recorded also. Um, <clears throat> before we open up our applications, it's customary that we also allow anyone to come forth and make a comment about items that are not on tonight's agenda. During the proceedings tonight, we'll talk about a special permit, I mean, excuse me, a site plan for 47 Henry Street. Um, we'll also talk about a site plan for 107 William Street and a special permit up on 1397 Ryan Road. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to address the planning board about another issue, um, please raise your hand to let us know. Okay, I don't hearing, see any. hearing none at this point, um, we're all getting familiar with the Zoom controls. I think we know how to raise our hand or wave them. So having no public comment, we'll open up our first hearing for uh, site plan daycare and detached structure by Alia Stoffer Kalazi at 47 Henry Street, map ID 32C 318 in Northampton. And is the applicant here or the applicant's representative to make a little presentation? I'm here, yep, I'm Alia. Okay. I'm just also noticing that somebody's raising their hand. I don't know if that was in response to the other. Thank you, okay. So Alia, if you just pause for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, Vicki, Vanji, did you wanna make a comment not about the William Street project, but something else? Yes, um, this is Bonnie Tumulty. We're sharing a, uh, a computer here. So my question is, um, at some point, can you tell us how we can find out or um, where we need to go to find out how um, uh, zoning regulations can be amended? Sure, we'd, we'd be glad to do that. That's really a question probably for your city councilor. Most of that work happens through the city council. That's the final step. Um, but uh, perhaps later on during the meeting, Carolyn can address that. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep. Okay, so back to our application for uh, a daycare and detached structure. Okay, hi, I'm Alia stouffer Kolozik. Um, I live in Northampton at 7 Hockenham Road in the same neighborhood. Um, the Montview neighborhood that we're talking about. Um, I've been an educator for over 20 years of young children and I opened up uh, a preschool um, slash childcare um, 10 years ago, 2011 with about you know six two-year-olds including my own child. Um, we were originally at on the property of Town Farm which is also in the neighborhood um, but our, uh, our tenancy there um, was running out and and so our intention was to find a property and a larger and or a larger building so that we could expand and and um, have a child care center instead of a family child care but that was in 2020 and there were some other plans that the universe had for us so um, we did we're still in search uh, for for a property and or building to expand and have a, a larger preschool with more spots for for young children in Western Massachusetts, which is a big need. So if anybody has any ideas, they can find me because we're we are actively searching and looking. But in the meantime, uh, we decided on a temporary plan to purchase a yurt and put it up um, on the property of one of the families who um, are part is part of our community, um, Kokoro and Dan Bensonoff. I see Kokoro's rectangle down there. And so that's at 47 Henry Street. So we put up a, a, a 25 foot, um, what do you call that? <laughs> I'm losing the word for that, diameter? Diameter, uh, yurt um, to, so that we could move off town farm and, um, and have our family child care there. Um, and so, I don't know how much you want me to say about it. There are um, 10 children, well, 11 children in total, but 
only nine nine or less come per day because they come you know different days of the week um, and there are two or three teachers there per day who park in the parking lot on the property um, and you know come down the driveway and par park in the in the parking lot and then uh, parents and families and caregivers don't go in the driveway, they park on Henry Street, which is a pretty wide um, street and is a dead end. So there's not a lot of back and forth traffic on there. So um, there's usually between eight and 9 a.m. between two and four cars dropping off um, and then you know leaving. And then again at 12.30 for half day kids, um, a only a couple of kids get picked up at that time. So maybe one or two cars. And then between four and 4.30, um, again, you know, two or three cars come at a time to pick up the children at the end of the day. Great. Yes, we've seen your application. It was pretty complete. Most of, I think the board's questions and concerns would be around traffic. The, mm -hmm. the use of the facility, the yurt as a daycare is allowed. So really, you know, there's no, it's, it's an allowed use in that area. Mm -hmm. um, there is, I think you've spoken with the staff about a possible fee in terms of the added um, traffic there for the cars. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think at this point, what we'll do is we'll turn it over to the board members to see if they have any questions at all, and then we'll open it up to the public. Um, I wonder if you've had a chance to talk to your neighbors and your butters about this development? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, we've since we've been in the neighborhood, so you know, Henry Street runs parallel to Ventures Field Road, which goes up over the dike. And then parallel to that is the long driveway that goes to Town Farm where we originally were. So we've been in the neighborhood and you know toddling around there for 10 years. And so we we are very well acquainted with lots of the neighbors. Um, and you know, pick grapes next door, um, and and other properties, and um, yes. So we are we've been talking with well one of the one of the neighbors directly adjacent is um, uh, the Watchers property, which that house hasn't been lived in for a very long time. But on the other side, we um, we have frequent open communication with with the other side. Great, great. thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's turn it over to the board members. Any questions for the applicant? All right. Well, hearing none, we'll open it up to the public at this point for comments about the application or questions for the board. And as a reminder, when we, uh, when we address the, your comments or questions, you address them to the board as opposed to directly to the applicant and we'll try to answer them as we can. So if you'd like to talk, please uh, raise your hand or wave your hand. I see we have one person in the queue. Mr. Nass, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I just wanna say Farm Hands has been a great neighbor while they've been in the neighborhood. Uh, that, yeah, there's a little rush of traffic in the morning and then later in the day. Uh, but, you know, generally it's parents with kids in their cars. And while they have that hurried look in their face because they have other places to go, they generally move through the neighborhood in a nice manner. And, um, and, um, and I just want to say to Alia that you guys are welcome to keep picking grapes at our house and the jam is delicious. <laughs> That's my comment. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment on this application? Lola Reed. You'll just have to unmute yourself, Lola. I'm sorry, it's not a comment, it's a question. I, I, I missed what the application is or is for. This application is basically for a daycare, uh, a daycare center on Henry Street that has been in existence for a while. It's based in a yurt, and it's really just about adding, uh, recognizing that there will be some extra traffic on the dead end part of Henry Street, 
in the morning and in the afternoon. It's a special permit, so the board will be looking at that. Okay, that, thanks. Okay. And Vicki Vanzi and partner company. <laughs> yes, I'm Bonnie Tumulty. I live at 87 Henry Street, um, just down the street from the yurt. Um, and I am very supportive of Alia and the daycare programs that she runs there. Um, my granddaughters were both part of the daycare program. Um, there's an addition on my house at 87 that also has daycare. Um, so it's been a wonderful addition to my life and I think to our neighborhood. So I very much support this. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Claudia Lefko residents. Hi, um, I'm Claudia Lefko. I'm Mac Everett, Claudia Lefko's <laughs> partner, and we're longtime residents of the neighborhood too. And I'd like to speak in support of Alia's project. Uh, I think having the preschool in the neighborhood has enriched us all. I've really enjoyed having the kids come by and chat with us about our gardens and the birds they're seeing and various other other matters. And uh, I have not been negatively impacted at all by the small amount of traffic of parents coming and going. Thank you, Mr. Everett. All right. And Kokoro Bentonoff. Hi, um, I live at 47 Henry Street. Um, uh, my partner Dan and I moved into this house with the intention that we open our Kokoro. If if I might, your audio is a little your your audio is a little scratchy. <laughs> And um, oh, did was the connection bad? Yes, now it's be, it's better now. Can you, can you hear me better? Yes. Sometimes it helps to turn off your video. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, my partner then I turn off the video. Okay, I will turn off the video. Okay, just the voice. Um, uh, what was it? Well, I was saying this house with the intention that I we we want to keep um, our house open for the community as much as possible, and wanting to um, and when Alia uh, uh, came at us and talked to us, we we just uh, responded right away. Yes. Let's do it, and it's been wonderful. And I, I love seeing kids running around and using our land very well, <laughs> we're, we're very well utilized. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a great experience working with them. So I fully support this project. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right, anyone else? Uh, V30, could you introduce yourself? You're on, you're still muted. There you go. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Lynn Yanis. I live at 30 Valley Street. Um, and I don't know why I'm showing up as V30. My apologize, my apologies. I'm a person. And I just wanted to say that as a neighbor, I'm <clears throat> I support this application. And also, I just want to say how much I appreciate the mention that Henry Street is actually a pretty wide street and also a dead end street. And those seem to me to be really important considerations. Thank you. Thank you. OK, anyone else wants to speak either in favor or some comments against this application? All right, well, hearing none, before we close the public hearing so we can have the applicant here to answer anything, does the board have any other questions on the application? 
Carolyn, would you just explain to us again the uh, the in lieu the uh, the traffic in lieu of the traffic considerations of payment? Sure. So um, this is a site plan review, so it takes um, so the use is allowed, but the board needs to look at technical aspects of the project. Um, that in 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 this case, you know, it's a it's a about a 450, 500 square foot sort of a, um, addition essentially to the property for the purposes of daycare. And even though they were located in another location in the neighborhood, there, that was never permitted. So we're sort of, you're looking at this as a, as a new use um, at this site. And the biggest issue with private schools, daycares, those kinds of things are really the traffic. Um, and the peak hour trips to and from the site. And the zoning does require for each additional use that does trigger planning board review that the applicants contribute to their, um, their fair share of um, the traffic um, impacts. And the board does have some ability to analyze, there's a standard in the zoning that uh, uh, presumes what um, a daycare based on size um, would, what kind of traffic would be um, generated by such a use. Um, and typically, um, and the zoning would, um, based on the square footage, um, indicate that um, the uh, applicant would be, um, needing to mitigate for up to five trips, um, peak hour trips, which um, in the zoning is defined as a value with a value of $1,000 per trip. That's $5,000. The board does um, have the ability to look at alternative ways of looking at this. If, um, for example, um, traffic impacts are no greater than if they were developed as a by right project without site plan review or subdivision approval, um, so you could take into consideration other um, factors like, you know, you're not, this isn't a standalone project, there's a single family house there. Um, also a daycare that serves up to six children is allowed by right without um, site plan review, um, but over six children is what triggers site plan. So as I had relayed in my staff memo to the board, you know, you could look at um, the fact that this is four more children than what it would be allowed by um, without going to the planning board and using an I, um, Institute of uh, Traffic Engineers generation numbers for um, daycare facilities based on the number of children served. Um, um, so if you looked at four, you, um, you could also evaluate that based on ITE numbers that that would be 3.1 trips or 3,100 instead of what the zoning stipulates for um, 10 children um, at $5,000. So that's really, I think, the biggest issue is sort of for the board to evaluate how they want to look at the trip generation numbers for this use. Right. And it's a one-time mitigation so the applicant could offer to make a payment in lieu of that or um, create um, some kind of improvement in the network that addresses traffic safety, traffic and pedestrian safety um, that has a value of whatever the number is that the planning board decides upon. Thank you. So we'll add that as a condition if we move forward and approve this plan. <clears throat> Okie doke. All right. Any other questions for the applicant or staff, or should we move to close the public hearing? I, I have a question. Sure. Your name and address is Aaron, and I actually work. I work at um, the the daycare. I'm just curious to know um, if there's ever exceptions made for that fee beyond like you were saying there like maybe something in lieu but almost like equal to that amount of money i'm just it, um the number sounds a bit shocking in the sense that we just get by 
getting by. Um, and we provide a really important service. Um, it's, it, I'm just wondering if that you ever make exceptions for um, childcare. <laughs> Well, Aaron, I, I would say um, we haven't come across a childcare situation as such within our site plan review in the recent future, in the recent past. Um, there could be a, a, a payment, as Carolyn mentioned, of up to $5,000, and we're reducing that by about $2,000 down to what we're projecting at about $3,100. So already we've um, kind of given the, the applicant a break, so to speak. But it's certainly up to the board members. There is some discretion there, given the neighborhood, given the, the, the use of the property. Um, but as it, as it stands now, we already have kind of reduced the payment that other applicants might have paid for uh, a similar project of that many additional cars. But I appreciate your comment and your your uh, attempt at easing the pain. All right, another question from the Van Z household. Yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, Carolyn mentioned something yeah. about by right. Um, so I don't know how that would impact this uh, yurt, the proposed um, use of that, um, you know, in terms of I mean, obviously that property by right has the ability to have many, many more units than they have. Um, so I'm not sure how that would impact the question of uh, cars. Sure, I can explain that. So um, even there are a range of uses allowed in the zoning district. Um, and even uses that trigger site plan review are considered uses that are allowed by right. Special permit is all, are only uses that are allowed by special permit. However, there's a threshold that you can move ahead with a project without further review. And um, that goes for single and two family home, two, up to two family homes that are less than 2000 square feet in construction. Um, go through without planning board review. Uh, daycare, family daycares that are defined as um, care for children uh, fewer than six in a setting, um, doesn't need site plan review by the planning board. Then there are projects as they get bigger, as they get more intense, they need planning board review. And planning board is the threshold that then triggers evaluation of traffic mitigation and traffic um, impacts. So um, yes, um, there are residential more residential units that could be added to this property. And yes, when those um, hypothetical units are proposed on a property, if it entails more than 2000 square feet of construction, which given the average um, house unit size in the neighborhood that would likely be triggered for anything of, of two family or greater. Um, so that then that project would also be required to address that incremental impact in trips generated by the, that use. So um, it really is, um, the issue is really not so much whether the use is allowed by right, but at what level does it trigger planning board review? Um, I have a a question. Um, so this is a this year, as you started, as when you started saying this, is a temporary, is a temporary thing until you find a better building. Is that correct? Um, is there, uh, Carolyn? Is there a way of, um, given that this is a temporary structure, and I would imagine, you know, the moment they find a permanent structure, they're gonna to have to deal with a similar, um, a potentially similar traffic uh, fee. Is there a way of pushing the traffic, the traffic cost for, I would say two, give them two years to find it, at which point if they haven't found it, they, they will be 
charged? Um, so interesting question for sure. I think um, many times temporary does turn into permanent. So I think if you were thinking about those, um, yeah. that right. line, then you could put a condition that says traffic mitigation is required upon and set a date, you know, that say is two years out from the date the permit is issued. It then obviously becomes an enforcement issue um, for the city to say, oh, let's check the calendar. It's been two years, you owe. On the other hand, we also have made arrangements with applicants to make sort of payments um, towards that traffic mitigation. Um, in So you know, every six months pay a quarter and then you know until you get your full payment made <clears throat> as opposed to a lump sum. So that's also an alternative sort of thinking along those lines. I don't wanna, I'm not trying to belabor this but I'm sort of thinking about other examples um, where if, for example, the, um, they stayed in the neighborhood with a permanent site, um, when they come to permitting for a permanent site, um, there's potential that that traffic um, has already, you know, if it's within a certain geographic area, that traffic um, could already be accommodated essentially from the original permit. And the, the only reason why I throw that out there is the planning board made such an arrangement with uh, Leah Honda on King Street when they just moved up, you know, a quarter of a mile up King Street, they sort of took their use with them. And so the planning board said, well, what, we, what we're gonna do is now zero out that old site because you've carried that um sort of existing condition with you so i um so that's also a way to think about if they were to stay in the neighborhood they wouldn't have to pay twice essentially mm -hmm. um that's slightly different than what you're suggesting sam i think is putting a timeline on it i think under the first that you know either way i suppose there is sort of a check that would be required by the city to go back and say, hey, um, you know, let's look at that old permit and see what it said about carrying either carrying forward traffic mitigation or going after and, and making a payment. But I think that um, um, I just I, I just think, think the board could offer flexibility. Like, if they're gonna be buying if, like assuming they, they buy a piece of land, there there would be there would be you know, there's clearly going to be a bank loan connected to this thing. And at that point, $5,000 or $3,000, whatever the amount is, <clears throat> wouldn't, it would just be lumped in with, with the loan. And it would be much easier for them to, um, to, to incorporate the that finance. into their cost, their cost structure. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, as a, as a parent of young you know, I don't like to give things away when they're not needed, but this is a actual, you know, child care costs are ridiculous already. And anything that allows costs to not go up even by a little bit, I know is appreciated by any parent out there. I completely agree. Can you explain um, what the fee goes to for mitigation? Sure. Uh, the city has been evaluating um, impacts of traffic for all sorts of uses for probably 15 years. And over that time, um, typically when you have a small project, the, um, there's small, uh, there, there's, um, you know, incremental impacts of these smaller projects. And so you can't really, um, traffic improvements are expensive, you know, a traffic signal is millions of dollars. It's not just the physical thing, but it's design that goes into it first. And so typically the money for smaller projects are pooled and then they leverage bigger pots of money. So for example, um, in fact, 10, 12 years ago, a 
project was approved in the neighborhood that triggered um, a payment of $14,000, that actually went to traffic calming in the neighborhood with construction of um, speed bumps. That's an example of smaller amounts of money being put to um, small um, improvements that have, you know, that do actually um, affect change and, and help, um, you know, within the neighborhood. On the other hand, smaller projects have also been pooled to leverage money, for example, the Pleasant Street reconstruction from and the complete we we leveraged that money to, to start the design process so then we could apply for complete streets um, grant money from the state and then all of a sudden um, Pleasant Street was reconstructed. So that's how we use little bits of if if there can't if there isn't a um, a um, use for the uh, an immediate um, known use at a site for a project, the money gets pooled and it's a, it is goes into projects that affect the network within the vicinity of that project. That's super interesting. Yeah, I definitely am aware of how insanely expensive <laughs> planning and building road projects are. Um, I just am wondering, you know, like what what the impact really is for this pretty small project that's temporary in its location? Well, we don't know what temporary means. Um, that can last for years. Um, and um, the whole point of, of having this traffic mitigation, even for the smallest projects, is that everyone is sort of paying their fair share. So this is a tiny project, this is tiny, um, in terms of the mitigation, even though for this kind of user, yeah, obviously every dollar counts and every, you know, the expense of childcare is um, a tremendous burden for people. Um, however, there are a lot of trips back and forth generated um, by schools and by daycares. And so um, it's, important to think about that and and you know the more that we say well this one's really tiny and that one's not so big then they start piling up and then um it's much harder to address you know once it becomes a much bigger problem so we feel like it's much more equitable to spread it across even the smallest projects up to the large projects carolyn you you outlined this exemption path of from 5,000 to 3,000. What is the leeway the board has in terms of exemption? Is that really like by the ordinance, we can go down to 3,000 or do we have leeway to, to make it whatever we want? Um, I would not say you have leeway to make it whatever you want. The only way you can do that is really if this project didn't normally need site plan review, but anything over six kids needs site plan review. I was looking for a, another path that said, well, at some level, you know, it's not, you know, if you just take it from what's by right, I mean, without planning board reviews, I should say, clarify to what would be, that gives a little bit of a break. I think you have leverage leeway to be flexible in how it's paid or when it's paid. I think that would be appropriate given that we've done that before with other types of payment in lieu of requirements. And um, uh, so, you know, if you wanted to go down the path of saying, look, you have two years and if you're not gonna be using the year after two years or whatever the timeline is, you decide. Um, I, knowing that, you know, since they're looking for a permanent site, I think you probably, I would say you haven't done that particular thing in the past, but um, I think it's a reasonable thing to think about given that they are looking for a permanent. But we don't have the, we don't have the authority to just say no traffic mitigation payment is required for this. Well, no, because I think there are lots of other applicants who would say, well, my project's small too. Right. What about me? Okay. I'm just asking that specifically. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okie doke. Um, let's hear from Jim Nash one more time. Thank you, George. It, it dawned on me that 
these guys may have already done this with, they were located two doors down. Um, they haven't left Henry Street. I'm just throwing that out there. I see Alia shaking her head no. Okay, I was trying that idea. All right. Good try, Jim. Yeah, I was Thanks. trying. All right. Okay, Aaron. I was just wondering if um, if it's ever possible for the board to actually direct the funds specifically for something. So the the Henry Street Venture Street Road Montview big intersection there is really quite unsafe. Um, you know, we we do a lot of work with the children and looking both ways and looking forward and um, and I believe I've I've heard of um, talk about that intersection maybe by the neighborhood um, a wish that it was a place that people were going slower and maybe even a stop sign being there or a crosswalk and if 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 we could say that this five thousand dollars was going to go to the stop sign and a crosswalk there I wonder if the neighborhood and the families might be able to help put that together um, if the money was specifically going to go towards making that a safer place. I, I, Aaron, that's a good question. And I think as Karen, Re Carolyn referenced before, sometimes what an applicant does is that they propose a usage for the, for the money that is very direct to their project. I don't know, I think then that depends upon them paying for some kind of engineering study or some of that work that goes into it and the construction, whether that could be done and have any kind of effect at that intersection within that $3,100 framework, I don't know. Um, but certainly that is a possible solution and I'm sure um, the applicant could talk with the staff of the planning board to see if that's possible to direct it towards um, a much more local impact. Carolyn? Yeah, the, the way that would work is the planning board can't allocate money for a location. However, the applicant can say, I will do X, Y, or Z work, obviously with permission from the DPW and making sure that it's something that meets the traffic warrants and is done in accordance with um, standards. And so oftentimes the way a condition is written is either the applicant makes a payment in lieu of providing those improvements or the applicant makes improvements up to that value dollar. And so absolutely that can be left open so that you all can, um, and yes, that intersection is problematic. So I think that, and that's exactly the kind of thing that um, those kinds of funds are used to do. We want, we don't just collect money for collecting money's sake. We want it to go to um, improvements that affect the safety for the people using the streets and not just cars, but pedestrians, people in strollers, you know, people with walkers and those kinds of things. So it really, if you want to take that approach and sort of leave the, the condition can absolutely be open-ended and then we don't care where the money, you know, it, it would get allocated as being, you know, paid for by this project. But if you did fundraising in the neighborhood and you came up with an, you talked to DPW and said, you know, we, we think we'd like to create some kind of improvement in this area. Do you think a crosswalk or a speed bump or um, some kind of signage stop signs don't really slow people or necessarily um, are good a good tool all the time for getting results that we're looking for so more physical improvements typically are better um, but that's a path for sure okay great so maybe uh, one more comment and then we'll try to move this along we have some other business tonight um, the Lefko household. Hi, thanks. I mean, this whole conversation is difficult because here you have a childcare program on a street that doesn't have a sidewalk in front of it. 
So the children don't even have a sidewalk. There's also no sidewalk on Montview Ave. And there's just, we're talking about such a little small impact. And a lot of the parents walk there or they come on bicycles with their children in the good weather. You wouldn't know there's anything extra in the neighborhood. And, on, and, and it's a public service. It's a service everybody doesn't need now, but people need, the city needs daycare. So I just see this as an un, undue burden on them and that they shouldn't, I mean, on, taking care of kids all day is exhausting, but they're gonna have to do something else. Uh, so that's one. And secondly, you know, in terms of the neighborhood having in the past had some uh, traffic mitigation money, we did have traffic mitigation money. And, and we do have two very inadequate speed bumps at for $14,000. But the money, according to Jim, our city councilor, what did go to Pleasant Street. So despite uh, the impact of, you know, infill housing, you know, we're not getting anything. And now we're going to ask this small, almost family daycare to do this. It doesn't really seem right to me, honestly. So just my two cents. Thank you. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions from the board for the applicant, is there a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Thanks, Melissa. And a second? Second. Second by David. All right. So the motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on closing the public hearing? Okay. Knowing that once we close it, we can't take comment from the public or really ask the applicant any other clarifying questions. All right. So uh, we'll go, because it's Zoom, we'll go to this roll call. Um, uh, raise your hand or say yay in you're in favor against the uh, the motion. So let's start with David. We're voting on closing, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Corinne. Yes. And Krista. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. Chris. Yes. And Sam. Okay. Sam says yes, and George says yes also. So it's unanimous. Close the public hearing. So now we'll work on a, uh, a motion perhaps to approve or deny the application and any conditions that might go along with that. Um, I think if we've read the staff report, there's really only the one possible condition, which is around the traffic mitigation, the in lieu of payment. I just wanna get a little clear. Carolyn, I don't know if this is like the Leah Honda thing you were talking about, but like normally when you make a, a site plan approval, it goes with the property. And if they sell that property, it's like approved for this use and this whatever, this site plan is approved. But you're saying if they go and do something somewhere else and we take away the traffic mitigation, then this site is no longer an approved 10 kid daycare anymore. Is that right? It gets pulled. Is that how that works? If they if they found a permanent thing and 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 didn't pay this traffic mitigation? Is that how? That would be the complicated piece of it. I'm, I just suggest, Lee is the only place where we've allowed sort of existing use to sort of carry to the new location. And- But in um, that condition, did the old site no longer have an approval as a car dealership because of that? Um, that it, um, Basically, yes, if a new okay. car, car dealership came in, that new car dealership would have to pay its fair share of traffic mitigation. Okay, I think that answers my question. So Carolyn gave us uh, some language that we might be able to use as a condition. Um, we could, one option would be to stick with the $3,100, which I like because there's a kind of a mathematical formula behind it. Um, and I think we've often discussed in the planning board about pulling numbers from the air that, don't, that we don't have any kind of real rationale for. And we don't wanna start a precedent here um, by totally waiving, I think this impact fee or just pulling a number out of our hat. So um, she proposed that if this $31,000 
um, could perhaps be paid over the course of two years in five, six, seven equal payments. Um, that might be a way to address it and at the same time alleviate some of the fiscal stress on the owners. Are folks somewhat amenable to that? Or we have to put go? the wording of the timing of the payment into the motion or can we just, you guys can work that out. Um, I think the condition should be, you know, um, timing be, timing. doesn't have to be made at the um, occupancy of the yurt or at the final inspection, but it could be made within, you know, um, um, through payments by a certain date or something like that. You don't have to be specific as to how much for each. Why I, I move that we approve this plan review uh, with a reduced uh, traffic mitigation payment of thirty one hundred dollars, representing four uh, uh, children above the by right uh, capacity. Uh, yeah, only because we are it's not in our power to totally mix the fee altogether. So. <laughs> That is my move and, motion. And in terms of a, a length of time. Oh, and then a and, uh, payment, uh, payment <clears throat> to be coordinated with the planning board uh, within three years. Second. And so just so we Good. could clarify, if in fact they move in, uh, they find another location within a year and they haven't paid any of this mitigation money, then that basically is a uh, wave. They will never have to pay any of the fees. Although they'll have to pay it for the new site plan. <clears throat> no, maybe not. The, the, wherever they locate, they could locate up in Chesterfield, Mass, for all we know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. To, yeah. But then it just reverts to an empty year with no trips. So it's not a problem. But I think what we're saying then, David, is that they could have all of these four, eight, 10 trips a day for the next. Yeah. you know, 600 days without paying any kind of mitigation. Correct. So do we want to ask them to give a certain amount in year one and year two, and then total it out by I, year I, three? Or I personally don't, but other people might have a different opinion. I, I think this is a public service that we're robbing Peter to pay Paul here. I mean, it's really silly. I mean, I think if we want to be equitable about it, we should raise everyone's property taxes and pay for it equitably, not like put it all on the burden on whoever's actually doing things, which are people who don't have the resources to just pay into these pools. So I would say three years is fine with me. If you want to make a different motion or other people do, that's fine. I mean, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, they, they, have, they have to pay, you know, what David's proposal is saying is, is that, you know, if they wait three years, then they have to pay it all at once. If they pay it over time, uh, that will make life easier and um and will make it that much cheaper when they when they you know build a beautiful a beautiful new spanking building someplace in the neighborhood okay i you know i want to be mindful that this is kind of a precedent if we give everybody three years to pay their traffic mitigation fee um, it be, could become a bit of a logistical nightmare for the city to manage that record keeping for one thing. Um, and also, I, I've been on the, I've been on the planning board for now for, I don't know, five, six years. This is the first time we've had a, uh, a, a daycare center come in front of us. If somehow we are opening a precedent for daycares getting a break, well, then that's the precedent we're going to open. But, um, you know, that's, I don't, I don't see this as a slippery slope that we're going to fall down and somehow we're, we're breaking our, our code. It's a, you know, I don't think anyone from any spectrum says that, that daycares, you know, give a, need a break. That's, 
there's all there's all kinds of carve outs to nonprofits and other entities because they provide public services. Uh, I don't think this is a this is barely a carve out. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, we're still charging in, them three thousand dollars for you know. In, in the future, in the future, this town will be daycares and pot shops. That's it. <laughs> Okay, the motion's been made with a condition to uh, have the fee of $3,100 be paid um, by, where are we? March, March 10, 2025. Any discussion? I just wanna be clear that the applicant can always opt to make the improvements as opposed to pay cash. So, whatever the value, the way I think the condition would be framed is either make a payment or make an improvement worth that in that three year time frame um, is, the, is the way it would play out. I just wanna clarify that because we have to give the option. Thank you. All right, so slightly amended most and David, you okay with that? So. <laughs> okay, all right. Any other discussion on the motion? All right, so we'll go to a roll call. Uh, let's start with Chris. Yes. And David. Yes. Sam. Yes. Corinne. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. Krista. Yes. And George will say yes also. Okay. So that's unanimous. Thank you very much for coming before us. Good luck with your project. Good luck in your search for a more stable location. Thank All you. right. So we're gonna move on to our second item today, which was scheduled for 720. And this is a site plan with a demolition of an existing house, construction of eight half scale units, by uh, Four Aces LLC at 107 William Street, Northampton, map ID 32C-198. And again, this is a site plan application and not a special permit. Carolyn, could you just real quickly kind of review for the board again and uh, um, the public um, what, what's involved in a site plan application versus a special permit? Sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, site plan is uh, an analysis or review about how the site functions. With it's a use that's allowed, but the board is looking at technical issues about how the site is situated, how it meets the standards, how it meets the performance standards, whether it's stormwater or traffic or lighting or landscaping. Um, that's um, compared to a special permit, which the board would evaluate as whether or not that use is appropriate in that given location. So this doesn't, it's not a special permit use. It's really just about how the use functions on the site. It takes a majority vote to four of seven members to approve a permit um, under site plan. Thank you. So we'll have a presentation by the applicant and their, um, presenters. And then after that, the board will ask a few questions for clarification sec, and then we'll open it up for public comment. So is the applicant or their specialist here to describe the project? So uh, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group uh, here on behalf of Venus and Stacy of Four Aces LLC. Um, and with us tonight also is Charles Roberts from uh, Cunital Architects who um, have been working on the project. So I've got a, a brief presentation. Um, I will turn over the second portion of it for, to Charles just to go through the, the architecture and then um, turn it back to the board for any questions and, and go, through, um, go through that process. So uh, with that, just real quickly to orient everyone. Um, so Pleasant Street, uh, you can see sort of a, on the left uh, middle side of the, the sheet here. Uh, Hockenham Road comes across uh, the bottom of the page. William Street um, runs, you know, essentially parallel with Pleasant Street, and then uh, Mont View is um, directly across the street from 107 Williams, which is this parcel here. 
um, highlighted in yellow. And so um, with that, hopefully everybody can see, let's see, see the, the so this is the existing, oops, I'm sorry, oh, existing conditions. Um, so the current site uh, includes a uh, one and a half story uh, single family home that is partially gutted. It was bought um, by previous owners who had intentions of renovating it and uh, for whatever reason, um, fell short of, of their objective. So the inside is, is largely gutted. Um, the shell remains. Um, there's some open space in the back and then a detached uh, garage structure in the rear of the property. Again, Mont View, you can see directly across the street um, from, from the parcel. A uh, couple of uh, so street view images of the existing site. So um, this is from Mont View, looking directly at the parcel. So this is the structure that remains there now. Driveway uh, comes in on the north side of the property. The property line is in in this location, roughly. Um, and then you know again on the on on the south side, uh, looking north up William Street. You can see 107 here in the background, um, tucked behind the the adjacent property here. Uh, and again, looking south, it's it's mostly obscured. From view from this large Norway uh, spruce that that sits in the front yard, um, the property I will note you know does sit right tucked up against the, the sidewalk um, you know similar to, to the property next door, um, but it does and and the side setback does um, you know exceed current setbacks so it is a non-conforming lot currently with regards to setbacks. Um, so the proposal is to demolish the existing house and garage, uh, develop a two and three story uh, building, which would house three half, uh, half units, um, or I'm sorry, eight half units, which are 800 square feet or less. Um, the, what you see here highlighted in the front and the back are the three story portions of the building. The center portion of the building, the center third is, is a two story building with a a roof terrace, a roof deck that would uh, uh, be an accessory um, uh, or amenity for, for the residents uh, and then mechanical equipment hidden um, in the backside of it. Uh, the lower units have uh, patios that uh, look to the south with um, some wood fencing that, that uh, provides some privacy. Um, there is a porch um, at the, as you'll see in some of the uh, elevations and a porch roof to to um, you know, mimic some of the other character and, and um, uh, 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 um, building typology on the street, sorry. The driveway maintains the existing curb cut. It's a 12 foot wide driveway that leads to eight parking spaces in the back. There's a small dumpster location for a four yard dumpster located in the rear of the property. Um, Access to the units is through um, through the side north side of the building, and then there's an additional one um, up in the front. Um, landscape plantings and you know such to to replace those being removed. Um, there are um, the, the total footprint is just a little over three thousand square feet. Um, and again, this is being uh, submitted under Section three fifty dash six. Uh, attachment eight. Um, and as, as you pointed out, it is allowed uh, by site plan approval. Um, there are two trees that um, fall under the, that are being removed that fall under the zoning ordinance. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's a 22 inch and a 34 inch tree that are being removed sort of in the center and, and obviously a large uh, Norway uh, spruce on the Northeast corner of the property. Uh, we are providing a number of trees to, to um, satisfy the replacement requirement. There is a um, 9.5 inches worth of uh, caliper inches that we are offering to pay into the tree mitigation fund um, just because there isn't sufficient space on the site. Uh, similar with traffic, uh, heard some of the discussion, <coughs> excuse me, previously in the other hearing, but again, there's one single family unit now, this will be, or one unit now, there will be uh, seven additional units, so it will be eight units total. So uh, there is um, a payment being offered in, in lieu of you know, specific mitigation um, uh, uh, strategies or efforts, uh, construction efforts uh, as part of the project. 
And again, that was, you know, they're, they're $1,000 per trip. So that is being offered as part of this project. Um, and so, yeah, just to take you through some of the more technical and, and um, uh, some of the plans that were presented in the, uh, in the application, but this is just a black and white uh, layout plan essentially of, of the proposed site. Uh, the driveway coming in, we're proposing a stamped uh, sidewalk to help delineate the, the pedestrian side of that, um, you know, that circulation. Here's a glimpse of uh, the front elevation from, um, from uh, William Street. Uh, again, patios on the south side to offer an amenity space for those lower units. Second floor units have balconies that uh, extend out over the north side. Um, to provide, you know, some outdoor space for, uh, you know, for each resident. Um, and again, the dumpster in the back of the site. Stormwater management has, you know, is obviously a challenge uh, in this portion of the, um, you know, of the city. And on this site in particular, it's a small site, just over a quarter of an acre. So this has been, you know, one of the, the bigger challenges on this site, just because of the limitations. And so, what, what we've arrived at is a, you know, a, a system that essentially gets sandwiched in between um, the, the existing, you know, or the proposed paving and parking area and, um, and high groundwater, seasonal high groundwater, which is really the, the limiting factor. Um, and so what this system proposes is really sort of the sandwich of, uh, of milk crates essentially is the way I can describe these. Um, they sit between two layers of wash stone wrapped in fabric. Um, this sits under, um, and you can see a little bit of this, what this system looks like uh, in the corner here. There's, a, there's an asphalt surface, there's a you know, gravel base under that. Then there's this stormwater you know, element, which really takes the majority of the space in that, in that parking lot sandwiched between um, you know the, the parking lot and that and that uh, that profile, and then existing grade and two feet below that to seasonal high groundwater, and so there is some you know some some ample space below that stormwater system, and this is designed to um, detain the hundred year storm, and one of the you know understanding one of the issues is the capacity of William Street. And, um, you know, among the many, um, you know, other uh, agreements that we've come to with the DPW, but one of their concerns uh, primarily was a, a pipe connection to the street. And so, you know, this, this is a contained system. Um, there is no contact, uh, connection to William Street. And um, so that was, a, you know, a solution that we were able to, to work out with them that satisfied all the other standards. And we are treating the stormwater in accordance with um, you know, all the other standards. And so it was, uh, you know, it's, it certainly takes advantage, full advantage of, of this site. We are recognize, recognizing that this site is slightly built up from adjacent properties. So in recognition of that, you know, one of the, one of the assurances that we wanted to provide was, um, you know, wrapping this system with uh, an impermeable uh, rubber barrier, essentially around the outside to avoid any you know, break out to, to adjacent properties or avoid anything seeping out of the hillside. So that's an additional assurance that, you know, we will contain all the storm water on site. Um, and again, just a couple of other, you know, amenities and highlights to, to point out against the dumpster enclosure in the back, this will have a, um, an enclosure around it um, that, you know, just is providing access for residents and, and trash removal. There are bike racks being provided in the back of the site. Um, this center portion of the building does have a basement. So that does provide some additional storage space for residents um, and which would include, you know, bike storage and, and place for, for, you know, other, other toys uh, and storage needs. And then, you know, lighting wise, um, you know, this, this project isn't proposing much, much lighting beyond um, some small wall mounted wall sconces at the major entries at the doorways. There is one small one in the back being, um, being proposed. And then again, uh, you know, these would be, there'd be one at each of the patio locations in the, and in the front as would, um, you know, you would typically see at any residential, um, uh, you know, residents. So these will be, you know, limited. I imagine the one in the rear would be a motion light. All others I think would be switch operated. Um, but, you know, certainly 
Um, you know, there's no other site lights that are being that are being proposed. I think there's more than ample ambient light in this in this portion of town to satisfy, um, you know, any of the lighting needs on the site. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Charles to talk about the architecture a little bit, if that works. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Charles Roberts with Cumital Architects, and I'm just gonna bring the drawings up, the architectural drawings up here. So this is um, a couple of views of the house. This is um, looking um, kind of directly down the driveway here at, at the building. Um, you get a sense of, uh, of, the, of the porch and the, the, um, the way the, the building welcomes uh, and, and addresses the street. Um, so this is an entry point for, for that particular unit on the, on the ground floor. Um, this is uh, the driveway uh, circling around to the back. And so this is that edge that Jeff was referring to, um, which is the, uh, the, the uh, pedestrian access for, these, uh, for the, the residents in the building itself. Um, and uh, this is a view from uh, the, south, the southeast corner of the building um, as, you're, as you would be driving up William Street. This, um, am I coming in loud and clear enough? I just wanna make sure that, um, this, is, this is sort of an interesting image because it, it puts, the, uh, it puts the, uh, the footprint of our proposed um, building and density on the site kind of in context of the larger area, the, the larger neighborhood. So these are, you know, small lots with tight frontages. Buildings are are, are hugging the, the the front street edge. Um, there are there are examples of, of buildings with comparable um, lot lot coverage um, and 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 building form and size in the neighborhood. And so, it's a you know it's a it's a it's a very dense neighborhood, and and the architecture I think is responding responding to that and by um, uh, honoring and addressing the street edge and and working with a with a mass and a scale that 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 isn't completely out of um, unfamiliar to the neighborhood. Um, so we'll walk through the plans here. This is the uh, this is the lower level plan that, that Jeff was referring to. So there's uh, the two flanking uh, wings of the building are slab on grade. There are two uh, egress stairs and, and access stairs serving the, the building. And this would be the, uh, the each unit's dedicated storage space and uh, and mechanical space for the for the building's hot water heaters and heat recovery ventilation equipment will be going um, down here in the uh, in the lower level of the building. Um, moving up to the ground floor. Um, these are the two main entry points in, into the building for the for the for the, the ground floor apartments and the upper level apartments. Um, this is the uh, the entry point that's off the street that uh, Jeff referred to, and so this is that front porch area which which um, this unit gets ownership of. These are the the um, the side yard um, patio areas for the first floor apartments, and um, there there are two bedroom apartments with a shared bathroom and, and an open kitchen living dining layout. Um, the units on the first floor um, have uh, a, a, a room that's sort of a, a swing room, sort of a den, guest bedroom, um, but it's not closed off in the space. So you're able to move around through that room and get access to the to the back patio areas. Um, on the second floor, um, the unit layout's very similar. It's uh, virtually identical with the exception of the fact that Instead of having that that swing walk through space to the to the outdoor patio, we now have um, another uh, bedroom, and then each of these units has a, a small balcony with a sliding door. So that's the outdoor amenity space for the for the second floor units. Um, third floor. Um, You're up there. What's that? Okay. Oh, so, sorry. Um, Oh, sorry. Third floor units, same same layout, except in this case, the uh, the center portion of the building is an outdoor terrace for the uh, for the for the third floor apartments. Um, the uh, roof plan here, uh, so this is simple shed shaped roofs. They're sloping east, so they're they're they um, they they are uh, um, adequate for for future uh, uh, photovoltaics. Um, code, which is a code required uh, um, aspect of the project. 
Um, these are the the elevations. Um, so this is this is the street elevation kind of front on calling out the material. So it's fiber cement siding, um, asphalt shingle roofs, and uh, you know simple simple trim, not not overly overly detailed, but letting the form and and, and architecture and volume biometric sort of uh, qualities of the architecture be the real ornament of the building. This is the um, uh, I'm sorry down down here is the uh, this is the north elevation, right? No, east elevation. So this is this is facing along the driveway. So these are those balconies that uh, we were referring to, the entry portals into the into the two wings of the building, and the um, uh, the outdoor terrace on the on the roof. Um, the rear elevation. Um, just simple, simple, just, re, you know, it's responding to the geometry. Um, it's really was, was driven by the site. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the site geometry and the angle of, of the property lines is what really sets the geometry of the building. So it's responding to the setbacks. It's responding to the allowable lot coverage. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, and it's responding to the zoning and getting, you know, how do we get eight units into a building that, the, the, that meets the lot coverage and is actually, you know, and, and then is responding architecturally in a way that's interesting. So that by, by creating these, these two wings, we're actually breaking the, the overall mass of the building down into, into smaller elements and letting the center por portion of this building with the rooftop terrace um, sort of mitigate between the two. And so, and so um, the architecture is responding really to the geometry of the site and with amassing is trying to, uh, to break down the overall scale of the building. Um, these are some rendered elevations, um, just to give a, a, a little more. These these have a little bit more character to them than those uh, the, the working drawings. But this is the south elevation with the with the balconies and the rooftop terrace entry port. It goes here. The street elevation. Um, this actually is a, is a is a utility room here for uh, electrical and uh, fire protection. These will be sprinkler buildings um, as per the building code. Um, this is the uh, uh, this the side elevation here. So this is the garden patios um, accessed by the lower level units. This again is just another view looking down the driveway. Um, these were just just these were some uh, this is some photographs of architecture around town that shows how you know this this you know these these kinds of buildings fit into these neighborhoods and they become and they become sort of part of the fabric of the town and and as and as you know as as people as the town is sort of working with the zoning that's that's being provided and, and and densifying and creating you know important housing opportunities for folks um you know the the architecture becomes a little more provocative at times and uh and it, but it uh, they, they fit into the neighborhoods over time and and they and you see these these examples and pockets of architecture that that, that don't look like everything else, but but it, but in time assume their own place and their own character and their own sort of integrity in in the uh, in, in the urban fabric of the town. Um, these are just I won't get into these too much, but these are just this is building sections here, so you get to see how it's three floors slab on grade. Um, the basement here in the uh, in the, the center portion and uh, flanked by the the other three three-story wing. Um, I believe I believe that's it for my presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Uh, anything to add, Mr. Squire? I don't think so. No, I think at this point we'd, we'd open it up to any questions Good. or comments. Good. All right. How about any clarifying questions from the board before we open it to the public? <clears throat> Where's the green the green space? So there's there's a fair amount of space around the south side of the building. On the back side, there's um, you know there's there's quite a bit of space that's not you know occupied by the by the patios. There are you know there are planting beds around the entire building along the front. Um, and again, just this wedge of you know space back here and in the back um, does. 
I, does that out? Okay, I thought we had like a certain percentage that had to. What, what am I thinking about? Yep, yep, you're right. The thirty percent is required, and they're showing on the plans thirty percent. That cannot be thirty percent. Well, we have to assume, Sam, that they did their calculations with square footage and all. It, it may not look to us. And I think we've had this question before for developers that their plans to the naked eye doesn't look like 30 percent. But no, no, I, 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 I get I get we have had that before, but there is. That I. Um, I, I. I push back on that 30% and like to see some other numbers because I just don't, I do not see 30% green space can, at all. Can, can you go to another plan? One of the earlier sheets, yes. I think, showed. Yes. I mean, so it's it's all of this space, you know, along the front. You know, outline with my hand here. It's all of, you know, with the exception of the bike rack, it's this space back here, all in the back, this, you know, and none of that strip. overhangs over there's, it or any of that kind of stuff. That there's there's plant away. there's a plant bed along you know along the north side in in these locations as well. Okay, I, I take your word for it. I I it seems suspect to me. Hmm. These um properties for rent or are they for sale? Z units. My understanding is there'll be rentals, but I don't know. Yeah, my, that's my understanding. Oh, okay. And then I guess one 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 more question: that uh, the system seems very cool for the groundwater. Has that has the effectiveness been demonstrated in the notion of rubber above grade in our climate? Seems I can imagine that failing. So yeah, I mean we've we've got quite a bit of experience with both that that type of system that that egg crate system that I was that I was mentioning. So we've mm -hmm. got you know we've got a fair amount of experience with that. We've used that in a number of projects because it's extremely efficient um, in terms of storage capacity. Cool. Um, but then the the rubber membrane is something that's commonly used in all sorts of applications. Um, you know whether it be dikes or you know any any time of uh, uh, any instance where you're trying to prevent you know migration of water, you know, across, across a site. Um, we've used it in a number of applications. Um, and we've used it, you know, as, as a recent example, we've got the, the entire stormwater system at River Valley Market in East Hampton is contained within a similar barrier um, because of high groundwater on that site. So it's, it's certainly something that we're used to using. Does it need any maintenance at all, or? I mean, the, the stormwater system itself, you know, the subsurface system does need maintenance like any other system. There's maintenance ports. It needs to be inspected a couple of times a year. The stormwater treatment chamber, you know, as with any other traditional sort of system, needs to be, you know, inspected and maintained, um, sediment removed. Um, all of that, you know, is, is part of the operation maintenance plan. But the, the barrier itself is just embedded and, and uh, you know, is, is a vertical layer between you know, the, uh, the, in, in the profile. So there's no maintenance to that necessarily it just prevents, you know, water or, or migration of, of, um, you know, some of the storage volume that we've got here, some of the storm water from moving, you know, moving horizontally. It, it encourages it to, to, you know, infiltrate downward. And, and, uh, Jeff, we're all painfully aware that our storms are increasing in their intensity, our rainstorms. Um, Absolutely. But the proposal, and so we talk about a hundred year flood, but uh, that I think also is changing each uh, decade. So the, the proposal is that if there is an intense storm and the system um, isn't able to cope with it all, that the overflow will go out towards William Street or somehow it's all gonna be contained on site. So yeah, so I mean, we've got a six inch high curb around the entire perimeter of the, of the parking lot. And it's designed that you know this system can accommodate a hundred year storm. Once it reaches capacity, it will begin to you know bubble out or begin to you know uh, you know you can see water outside or 
uh, ponding outside of these catch basins, which are the locate uh, the low points of the site. And so once that reaches, I think three or four inches, there's you know the the only other high point is at the driveway apron. So this effectively would all pond with you know a couple of inches of water in the most severe storms, and you know connect to and flow out of the site, you know, to join the rest of the storm water. And, you know, particularly during those events, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a substantial amount of water. So most of these systems, probably this one also, are gonna be, you know, overtaxed. And so there's some ability to keep and detain some of that water on site and allow that to, you know, to, um, to subside, um, you know, just as, you know, along with this system out in William Street. And um, just in terms of the building, I, I think I heard early in the presentation that that rooftop um, area was going to be uh, accessible for all the tenants, but really it's just accessible by the two top uh, units, correct? Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> you can't access that from a common area. There really isn't a common area there other than the stairwell that takes you to the third floor, but not to the roof. Right. So the, 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 the stair, the stairwell is a common space. And then the only people who would be, who would have access to those rooftop gardens are the, the two top floor residents. And the thinking is that the first floor have, have, have the first floor folks have the outdoor um, gardens off, you know, off to this, um, is it the West? And then, Outside. and then the, yep. and then the, um, and then the, uh, the 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 you know the, the people on the second floor, they have they have those, those sliding balconies. So, you know, it's it's, it's the sec the second floor has has sort of the, you know they're they're the people who are a little bit squeezed. But but a balcony is nice because you can you know you, it's it's easy to maintain and you can open your door and sit out there and have a cup of coffee in the morning and just see what's going on in the world. So, I think it's you know we we tried to be equitable about the way we. We distributed the uh, uh, um, the outdoor space, and at the same time, have it be dedicated and private to individual units. Great. Uh, can someone on the team speak a little bit to the traffic evaluation that you did and the impacts? Sure. So we, um, you know, we based it on the ITE numbers, um, you know, which is which is sort of the standard. Um, and again, the, it's one residential unit there now, which generates, you know, one trip in and out. And so this, you know, obviously creates um, an additional seven units. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the, there are additional trips associated with that. And, um, you know, part of that uh, evaluation is, is what feeds into the, the mitigation, the traffic mitigation fund. Um, <clears throat> And so, yeah, unless there's specific projects or, or it's earmarked for a specific, um, you know, purpose, um, you know, there are improvements along, being made along the, um, the front intersection of William Street with a new sidewalk and, and curb ramps and such. Um, but that the remainder of that fund can be used for, you know, any number of, of improvements. Thank you. Other questions for the board members? Yeah, solar ready piece of it. It's it's sloping to the east. I mean, I guess it's it's a low slope. I guess maybe it's it's somewhat inconsequential. Yeah, um, it's it was it was it was a compromise um, based on where we wanted to direct the water um, off the roof and and also the architectural form. We wanted to slope the roof actually towards the street to to lower the um, the effective bulk of the building to the street um, and also it's 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 the most regular um, direction of, it's the most regular geometry of the building so the roof slope evenly sloping in the other any other direction would have created odd geometries and and also just sort of some some stormwater collection issues so we opted for the for the eastern ex uh, exposure thank you um, the DPW had quite a list of uh, remarks for the mm -hmm. team, I think. Are, are you comfortable with responding to those? Perhaps you've already done some of that. 
Yeah, I mean, I have, we haven't responded formally. Um, you know, there, there's a number such as detail references and such, um, or details that need to be provided. Um, you know, that we can that we certainly intend to provide. I think you know, reviewing the bulk of these, most of them are items that would surface in the construction document process. You know, they're really specific details and and spot elevation or grades for curb ramps, curb elevations. A lot of that stuff would certainly be you know part of the next phase of of you know development in, in the construction package. Um, I know one of the comments re was regarding uh, the need for an, a stormwater and agreement. And even though a stormwater permit isn't typically required for you know, projects that um, you know, are under an acre, um, that, was, that was something that, that was you know, amenable to everyone recognizing the, you know, the concerns about stormwater and, and maintenance. And so you know, that's certainly something that will come in in, in, you know, as part of the process moving forward. Um, there wasn't anything in there that I, I saw that was, um, you know, that would prevent, prevent us from moving forward. It, it's mostly construction detail oriented stuff. You know, interestingly enough, I think in the, in the Southwest, in the rear corner behind the garage, there's a, a drain there with a drain cover. Is that an existing system? Was that something for the other condos that was installed? Is it a city system? What is that? So my understanding of that, um, and this is you know through discussions with you know DPW and and the city, is that when that condominium development happened in the on the rear portion of the um, you know behind the property. So this um, this development here off of Hockenham Road. Um, when that got developed, it prevented, um, this site was, was already somewhat raised, the 107 site. And I, apparently this, you know, when they constructed this site, it prevented some of the stormwater from, you know, continuing to the south like it does naturally now during some of the larger storm events. And there was a pipe or a culvert that was essentially installed to convey, you know, water across this section of property because it, this, this 107 parcel was effectively creating a dam from that natural flow of water. Um, I'm not sure if there's any, we, we didn't discover any existing easements or you know, any other um, you know, provisions that allow for that to be there. Um, certainly wouldn't intend to block that flow and, and interrupt that, that migration of, of surface water. Um, so I think, you know, it's just something that we'll need to deal with during the construction process. And, and but that's, that's my understanding. Thank you. Hey, okay. Jeff, that, um, that hand sketch you kind of showed us of the uh, detention basin, mm -hmm. infiltration basin. So DPW hasn't seen that yet. Is that correct? Because it seemed like their comments, um, they didn't quite understand with what they had seen, how that system was gonna integrate into the existing topography. So is that what you're showing us here? So, yeah, so this image here is, I mean, I, this sketch was something I just put together this afternoon to help sort of describe, you know, what this included, but this, this system here is what their comments responded to. You know, I think they, they were, you know, there were a couple of comments relative to maintenance and, and inspection ports. A lot of that stuff is, you know, shown on here that we just haven't had time to, you know, clarify. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, clarify yet, but. Um, and that that 113 contour that kind of sticks out, um, that's not supposed to be there, right? Is that just a, a floater? Uh, this, are you talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah, so that may, it may be just a bad line on, on this plan. I'd have to, yeah, I can double check. Okay, well, it's crossing the 113, the 114, the 115. So I'm assuming that that's kind of like a renegade 113, just mm. for my reading of the plan. No, so there is a 113 that does wrap around, right? So this this 113, there's a 113 contour that exists there now. Oh, that's this a, one. sorry, that's an existing contour, not a proposed contour. This this one thirteen is a proposed. This is an existing. Are you sure about that? Because your parking lot elevations are up at one fifteen. So yes. Okay. So there's 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 some reveal, like you can see on the backside of this, that will be visible. 
115 is existing? One, 115 is, is up in here, yes. You have yep. me so confused. There's, there's, there's a one, the existing 115 contour is right here. Okay, if you just go to the, the um, I don't know what it is, the southwest corner of the house, of the structure, there's a mm -hmm. 115 right there. What is that? Yes. Is that a proposed oh, contour? Yes, no, I'm sorry. This this is a this is this contour is a rogue 113 contour. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. Yes, that, I'm that sorry. Too, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, these um, these and then so my only question is, you know, as you're saying, this is kind of a high point, this site. Um, and now we're putting this the stormwater basin in and we're putting an actual physical barrier in the ground, I, I am a little worried about migration of, of groundwater. You know that, so that epoxy barrier is going what, one, one foot above seasonal high groundwater? It's, I mean, we haven't called out a specific elevation, you know, for the bottom of it. It would presumably go to the base of whatever system and, and adjacent, you know, concrete or, or, or curb or wall is, is adjacent to it. But it would certainly go below, you know, the, the base of the system. Okay. Again, the, the idea was really to contain that entire, you know, that entire area. Okay, I think, and then I think you already answered this when you were when you were talking about the uh, pervious and impervious areas. But you're not counting any permeable pavement or pavers or anything like that in your pervious area. It's no. all landscaping, right? Okay, and Caroline, I think just because this comes up so often, we should start requiring. I don't know if we can do this actually, but. I think it would be awesome to get an exhibit from developers kind of just showing us their pervious and impervious areas because it always seems like you know 30% doesn't look like 30% on the page. I think that would be that would help everyone out clarifying these lot coverages. Sure. Um, that's an easy fix for a submittal requirement. Thanks. That's all I have. Chris, I, I appreciate your comment about that impermeable material. To be honest, you know, we're seeing more and more of these underground retention systems, um, which, are, you know, are, are covered over. They're really not visible to inspection. There's a maintenance plan that talks about them being inspected quarterly, but the city doesn't have any way to monitor that, of course. Um, it's all up to the association or the developer, or the homeowner. Um, the abutter to the south there, has already remarked about the, the change of uh, his water, the, the drainage onto his property from that uh, other condo development alongside the railroad tracks. Um, I, I guess I'm somewhat nervous that that rubber main brain will last 15, 20, 25 years. And then what happens when it becomes stretched or pervious, um, what happens downgrade from that? Um, and who would who would be responsible then for protecting that abutter's property? Um, so yeah, I think yeah, you know it's just something for us. We don't, Jeff. I don't think you or any engineering companies has a a long longitudinal study of these um, uh, uh, undersurface retention systems to say that they're performing twenty five years after their installation to the day that they were finished. So I guess it's a concern of mine, and I think it's a concern of the DPW as we start to see more and more of these on these infill projects. Um, so, uh, and I don't think, and I don't know what the solution to that is. If there's a reduction in the size of the mass of this building, therefore allowing for more green space and then more retention of water just through the natural, um, saturation of the ground if that's a solution and then minimizing some of that underground system but i'm, I'm just kind of concerned over the course of time that the the city uh, may be running into trouble <laughs> with a lot of these systems 
so that I guess that was more of an editorial comment than anything. Um, I'm sure you don't have any answers there or any guarantees, um, but it is because this is an unusual piece of property because it is raised up um, and it's going to be hard to protect the, the two adjoining properties, even though you've done your best and I, I appreciate the design gone into it. Hey, Jeff, can you can you confirm for me? Um, I was reading through the drainage report. It looks like um, because you're you're recharging all of this water on site, not only are you reducing peak flows off site, but you're also reducing volume of water leaving the site. Right. So correct. So net net, there's there's less stormwater leaving the site in the post development condition than there was in the in the pre development condition. Correct. Overall, yes, that's that's true. Yeah, we. I mean, this the system is slightly larger than it. You know, absolutely has to be just in recognition of you know, I guess you know construction efficiency, but also you know the ability to you know we we know that larger storms are coming and that that you know oversizing these is is not necessarily a bad thing. And um, so yes, you're right. We did try to reduce overall peak flows off the site. Thanks. Other questions from the board or should we open it up to the public? Okay, so before we open it up to the public and I know we have some uh, very interested folks here from the neighborhood. Um, I wanna assure you that the planning board members have read the 14 or more um, letters that have been submitted to the planning board and to the planning staff. Um, they, there's a, there are some common threads to those letters and I'll, uh, I'll take Mr. Everett from 40 Valley Street as an example. He speaks of his, uh, the impacts of a significant increase in car traffic, further loss of green space in an already densely populated neighborhood, possible loss of an existing home that matches the character of a neighborhood, the addition of structures that may not be aesthetically um, pleasing, the possible loss of an iconic tree. So those are common threads that we saw in many of the letters. Um, so as you do come to the podium and make your remarks, please try to limit yourself to somewhat new information because the board is very much aware of your concern about traffic and your concern. Everyone, knew, the letters to a person voiced your support of affordable housing. This project cannot be construed as affordable housing as we understand it, but it's uh, uh, part of the mixture of housing that Northampton, the planning office, the planning board, the city council is trying to um, address across the city. But affordable housing, no, it's, it, it is not. So with that, I'll ask folks to limit their um, comments to two or three minutes and we'll and raise your hand, get in the queue and we'll start with, uh, Lola Reed. My, again, my, my uh, question, not comment. Um, we had a meeting that the neighborhood had a meeting with the owners on the 28th of uh, February. And we were told that this was going to be uh, an eight unit a uh, condominium and uh, that the uh, units were going to be sold at a cost of a, around $400,000 per unit. Now, er, earlier in this meeting, someone answered that this was going to be rental property and not property to be bought. So I just want some clarification on that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Damija, one of the owners, is here, so maybe he so, can. Yeah, no, I can answer you. that question. It, and uh, excuse me, one miss, one minute. So Lola, I think what we'll do is we'll collect all the comments because there will be a, a pattern of them, um, and then we'll address the comments at the end of the towards the end of the public comment session, so we can list them and see the patterns if that's okay rather than interrupting each speaker. Thank you. Um, let's go to, uh, John, you have your hand raised. 
Okay, I'll put you in line after the left go household. Sigrid Smaltzer. Thanks. Um, so I live at 102 Williams Street, um, and I did submit a letter, so I appreciate your um, saying that you've, you've read them. I have a question also. I don't understand what could possibly be done to mitigate um, traffic, like what, you know, thousands of dollars, yes, but, you know, we can't do a big dig here, um, even, you know, the too much water, and it's not, you know, not plausible, right? So, like, what what could possibly be done given the narrowness of the street um, to, uh, you know, uh, to mitigate the traffic problems, which are already severe. And the danger, not just inconvenience, I'm talking, I'm talking hazard. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. And the left goes. Um. First, I wanna make a comment on behalf of David Farrell, who is the abutter at 113. You re referenced how his property is next, uh, is downhill from 107. So 107 was built up. So it's, it's significantly higher than the properties on either side. For, I guess one, just to stop myself, I'm curious if the board members walked around the neighborhood, because when you look at these renderings on the screen, it doesn't really look like our neighborhood. And it's a very sort of snappy uh, graphic about this building that's gonna appear here, but you do, doesn't that give you a feel for what's actually around it and stuff? So just to, if you would put that on the question list. But so Mr. Farrell is so stressed, he couldn't come on to the Skype meeting and he could barely dictate a letter to me. His property is has been flooded since the City View Apartments went in. And the solution the city has offered him is a sump pump in his backyard. So when we get, and it, it's often very wet back here, when it's there's excessive water, what he has is a sump pump that he has to maintain. And he's had to replace the pump three times, he's told me. Each time has been $150. So uh, he's obviously very concerned about the water situation. And so I'm glad to hear that you've raised that. My point, and I wrote a very long letter, I know, and I, but I've been working on this for like, we've lived here 40 years. And so the whole time we've lived here, we've been had, we've had to take account of, of and take care of this neighborhood. So my, uh, the question about the architectural integrity of the neighborhood seems critical to me. This is an, a historic neighborhood, one of the oldest in the city. Six or eight of the houses are on the historical record in Boston. We've maintained the integrity of this neighborhood because people have bought houses who could, they were affordable houses. They bought the house and they've improved it. They, have made, they haven't put large additions. They haven't demolished the building. They have taken very good care to keep the character of the building intact. But not only the building, we have, they've maintained the trees, and you talk about gardens. We have that very large yards with big gardens. So this property, when you take away this house and that iconic tree and put up this building, and I must agree with Sam, it looks like it's going to cover the building and the, the parking lot, 90% of the property. It's going to destroy the, it's a very central house in the neighborhood. It's where Montview meets Williams. You know, it's a very central location. And I think it's going to destroy the architectural integrity. We're happy to have rich people move to this neighborhood. I never thought we would because of the sewage plant, actually, and because we have a flooding problem. So it's probably great, you know, uh, great to invite rich people to come and live here. But honestly, I think we should maintain the house. It's a sturdy house. The man who built it, it's not like it's gutted inside. It's in process of being rebuilt. And he estimates it would cost $50,000 to finish it, as opposed to whatever it's going to cost to demolish it and build this. A young family in town, who didn't have carpentry skills, but would hire somebody, could then buy the house at what it was sold at, which was $208,000, and have an affordable place to live, one family, rather than bring in eight rich 
people to live there with their cars and cover the property. So I really think that it's, it's the duty of the planning board to look at the in architectural integrity of this neighborhood and I hope you will. So I'm very much against this building and this whole project. And I get seed myself, my time, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to, I'm sorry, it appears to be John at the bottom of your screen. Could you identify yourself? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not John, it's Lynn, who's married to John and has been living next door to Claudia and Mac for 25 years now. And it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm also very much opposed to this. Um, I find it, um, frankly, as a community member, insulting to have this referred to as infill. This is not infill. There was one house, and now you're talking about something like 20 additional bedrooms. You can call it eight units, but I'm hearing some of them are two bedrooms, some of them are three bedrooms, and yet there's an allowance for eight parking spaces for something like 20 bedrooms. That's not how people live. And we know that, and we know what the impact is going to be on our neighborhood, on our families, on our traffic patterns, which are already very, very tight and dangerous because of on-street parking, because there isn't enough parking for all the units in the neighborhood because it's an old neighborhood and it was built before every person had their own vehicle. That's just the way we live now. And to be presented with a plan that pretends otherwise is, I'm sorry, it's insulting. Um, there was one other point that I wanted to make. Um, well, I don't think I'll have a chance to make it later because unlike what they did with the previous project, we have to speak once and have all of our comments taken together. And that also seems like a problem to me. I guess I wanted to go back to what Jeff was saying at the very beginning because he did say there are site limitations. That's why they couldn't have an, as many trees as are needed. There are limitations for stormwater management. It's slightly built up from adjacent properties. It is not slightly built up from adjacent properties. It is a one family house that is going to have 18 or more bedrooms. And there's a limitation that the architects and the engineers are coming up against. There are limitations of space. There's limitations on the street. There's limitations of what the ground can handle in terms of water. And all of these factors are saying, no, you cannot have eight units and 18 bedrooms on this little plot of land. The one other point that I wanted to make is about sidewalks. And throughout this neighborhood, as we mentioned with regard to the previous project, there are streets around here that don't have any sidewalks. There are streets that have minimal sidewalks. None of the streets have that nice space between the sidewalk and the road. They're really, really tight. That section of Williams has the narrowest sidewalks you can imagine. So how can we talk about a sustainable Northampton when here we are in a downtown neighborhood and you cannot fit two people on one sidewalk walking next to each other or walking in opposite directions. That is not sustainable. It is not friendly. It is not the way we want to be moving in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luke Brown. Hi, uh, I'm Luke Brown. I'm at 114 William Street, so kind of diagonal to the site. And uh, our house was, I'm here with my wife, Grace, and our house was in some of the pictures. Um, my main question that I'm thinking about right now, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what the neighbors are saying, but my main question right now is about sustainability of the landscaping. 
in terms of, I understand that the Norway spruce in the front will probably have to go and other trees will be replanted under some regulation of a certain size. But is one question is, is there any regulation about what types of species need to be replanted? And if those species are potentially adapted to future changes in climate, and, you know, are we talking native species? Are we talking introduced species? And then also, is there any requirement that those species or that those trees have to be established after a certain time frame. So, you know, we could take down a large tree and plant a new one, but there's no guarantee that that tree will actually establish and survive. So that's that's what I'm wondering about. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. And yes, there are regulations around that, but we'll address those. We'll answer those pretty specifically later on for you. Thank you. And back, uh, Carolyn, uh, I'll get you right after the Van Z household, okay? That's us. Awesome. Hi, I'm Bill Yule. I'm part of the Van Z household <laughs> friendship group. <laughs> um, it, well, I have two comments. One is specifically about the uh, water retention. I, I, I'm a retired person who worked in, in development in the Cambridge area, and we never were able to successfully retain water on site, even if we're burying massive structures on the site for water storage. Um, that's in a place where the soil percolates. Here, the soil does not percolate, and we all know that. You know, when the water, when it's when you're saturated in my backyard, we wait for the wind evaporation to take the water away. It just doesn't go down. So I don't think there's any chance that this water retention system is going to be successful here. I just think we're kidding ourselves. That's one. Two, all the problems that we've talked about are are caused by trying to jam too many units on a very small site. And it seems on the face of it impractical. Um, the tree has to come down because you need more units. Water retention has to happen because you're paving the whole site. Uh, you need at least eight cars and maybe as many as 16 cars for, this, for the 16 people who are gonna live in these units because who could afford $400,000 except two people with two cars? So William Street is not going to be happy about having 16 cars zipping in and out every day. Uh, traffic retention, whatever $7,000 you're given to put in speed bumps somewhere else is not going to address that at all. It's going to make life much more difficult for the William Street residents. That's my comments. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Yule. All right, let's go over to Carolyn Oppenheim. Should I? Un oh, OK, I'm unmuted. So I live um, next to Bernadette Giblin, who is directly across the street. I'm on Montview. I'm on three Montview. And when I back out of my driveway to go wherever I'm going, I usually take William Street. Um, I have no choice but to take William Street for the beginning of wherever I'm going. I'm very nervous when I turn right or left on William Street. Um, the visibility isn't great. And as you know, it's a one lane street. That's a two, that's a, it's a two way street with only one functioning lane because of the parking down at our end. Further up, it's a little different, but down at our end, it is basically a one lane street that goes two ways. And because of the parking, you have to be really careful to see if a car is coming from farther up because you have to make a fast decision. Who's going to pull over for the other guy? And we get these cut through people who are not friendly neighbors, like a main island where you go slow and wave high, you know, and um, they may become barreling through. So that's very scary. Now, as I'm coming out of Monview, I'm gonna be seeing cars coming directly towards me from this new development. So I now have to worry not only about the people coming from the left from Hockenham and the people coming down, I also have to worry about the people coming across. It is crazy. That's one thing. The other thing, so I'm just saying that intersection there is going to be insane. And I'm surprised we haven't had more accidents yet, actually, um, because it's an accident waiting to happen, especially at night. 
and uh, the ambient light is not so great, despite what he said. Um, so it's tricky. The other thing is, people walk in the street in this neighborhood. There's only, the sidewalks are skinny. A lot of people have bushes that extend into the airspace of the sidewalk, and not only can two people not walk on it, I have to tell you that a lot of it, only one person can walk for part of it. And so somebody's coming, you have to decide just like the cars, who's gonna go on the street and who's gonna stay on the sidewalk. And sometimes you just get on the sidewalk anyway, cause you don't wanna get scraped by people's bushes. So now I'm walking in the street and there's more traffic coming. I mean, it is very crazy. And the idea of adding more cars to this just gives me heart, heartburn. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, Mr. Atevedo. You're still muted. Yep, there you go. <laughs> uh, thank you, George. Um, hi, I'm Omar. Um, I'm over at 14 Hockenham. Um, I'm a fairly new resident to the neighborhood. I've been here about three years um, and I absolutely love it here. Um, it's one of the best places I've ever lived in my 35 years <laughs> of life. Um, and um, I didn't know this was happening until I saw the, the, the posting on, on, the, uh, on the house. Um, and I was absolutely just, um, baffled I I feel very emotional right now actually uh, I didn't think I would but um, this neighborhood means a lot to me there's um, uh, a lot of beauty beauty in it it's a very quiet neighborhood there are a lot of different kinds of people here um, and um, we already have a, a fair bit of issues that affect those people we have we have uh, a lot of uh, pet owners like myself. We have a lot of, there are a lot of families. There are a lot of kids here who go um, from each other's, from one house to another. And just to, to think the, that the traffic problems that we have here already, people barreling down the street, like it drives me crazy. It makes me so angry that there are so many people that are always cutting through our neighborhood, going so quickly and then adding more cars onto that is just is is not not good, <laughs> and um I'm sorry, but I just absolutely hate the structure. And everyone is right; it just does not go with the with the architecture of the neighborhood, um, not at all. And I I think I'm the most infuriate infuriated at the thought that each of those um um apartments, condos, whatever the hell they are are gonna be $400,000. Like that's infuriating to me. Like how dare you build something like that here? Um, like I would love to one day buy a house in Northampton. And I even thought about that house, <laughs> buying that house in the future. I can't do it now because of my financial situation at the moment, but I, you know, just it, it just limits the chances of people like me being able to buy houses in the neighborhoods that they that they I'm a, I've, I've already outed myself as a renter but I am a renter and I would like to be a homeowner it's preferably a homeowner in this neighborhood and I cannot do it with four hundred thousand dollar condos so um yeah this this whole situation is is absolutely horrible and I stand by all my neighbors thank you uh, Mr. Everett. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I want to thank you, George, for quoting me earlier <laughs> at the beginning of this session and I as, and, and expressing my some of the specific concerns. I just want to make a few general comments uh, and I have a couple of a couple of questions too. Um, going back to the stormwater, I share the concerns everyone's expressed about the stormwater and the viability, the long-term viability of this solution that has been proposed for the site. Um, and I, yeah, we have, we have also a lot of clay in the soil here and our backyard retains water like crazy. So I think there are serious retention problems. Um, 
Also, uh, I was going to mention that the former owner of the house has told in a conversation we had said, just to let you know, um, there is asbestos siding on the house underneath the siding that we see today. So just I'm hoping that there isn't a demolition issue that comes up. But if it does get demolished, I think there's going to be a lot of concern about that uh, and that it's secured properly. Um, given that the site is raised, I, that apparently, I'm assuming that was done artificially at some point a long time ago. Somebody decided that they wanted their site to be a little bit more dry and they added fill. I guess I'm wondering, should in terms of the, the neighbors, the ferals and, and the drainage problems we've talked about, shouldn't that be leveled and gotten back down to the grade uh, before any construction project were to begin? Um, but, um, you know, going back to the general reaction of the neighborhood, I think, I, I know that you guys on the planning board don't create zoning. That's the province of the city council. Um, but, you know, I think it's important for us to share with you since you're very much involved with planning and are concerned and well-educated about it. The, the optics of some of these infill projects that, have, that are, are happening in our neighborhoods. Um, our neighborhood, like a couple of other neighborhoods, has been designated as an infill zone. Um, and we've seen a lot of progress in that regard in the last few years with uh, the building of the lumber yard and 155 Pleasant Street City and then View. on the and City View uh, condos and then on the higher end, the Shaw's Motel site, the condos there, and of course the St. John Candius Cantius. And, and there's a bunch of other pieces of land in this ward that could face similar kinds of development. And, you know, it, it feels to us in a lot of ways like the city has just decided to shoehorn as much as possible development into this area. And it just feels overwhelming to people. It feels like too much. Uh, and that's not to say we're not in favor of additional housing especially affordable housing, but putting eight in this as, for, as an example, putting these eight units in the place of a single family home just feels totally out of proportion to what uh, a, a sensible infill project would be that really tries to integrate with what is here already. So, okay, that's, that's the end of my two cents and I appreciate your listening. Thank you. All right, before we go back to the Van Z household, is there anyone else who hasn't had a chance yet? Mr. Nass, Councillor Nass. Thank you, George. And just so everybody's clear, when I'm in this meeting, I am just another member of the public and I have no power over George or anybody else on the planning board. So um, I do, um, you know, I, I'm actually conflicted in many ways here. Uh, the, uh, the, the half units are something that city council just approved uh, with the idea of creating more density, uh, but more opportunities for people to have attainable housing. And that, um, and this is actually the first uh, project that's come before the city, or, for this, um, and that, um, and that, yeah. So I, I that is one of the sources of conflict for me here. Um, I have a number of questions, um, and um, have agreements been hammered out between the uh, two abutting property owners with the Farrells and the Willards? I made efforts for uh, for the property owners to meet with both of them and that uh, I was hopeful that some sort of a agreement around screening has been reached. I'm a little bit worried that based on what Claudia has shared that uh, about uh, uh, Dave Farrell, that, that hasn't happened. Um, around the, I, the, the idea of rubber barriers holding in, um, you know, being the form for the parking lot to hold the, I, I have a lot of concerns about just like a, a tire running over that and 
maybe, you know, breaking it or something like that, or uh, plows in the winter. I, I, I'm not familiar with the material, but I just have a, some, some questions around how it's going to hold up over time, it, as opposed to, you know, um, you know, concrete or something like that. The issue of rentals and condos that I, I, my support for this initially had to do with it being based that the, the, the plan was for rentals. And that's the information that Carolyn gave me. And I think that's what the architects shared tonight. But I believe we heard at the neighborhood meeting that they were going to be condos and that um, I, you know, that any, I, I'm, I am partial to rental units because th that is one of the things that I've heard a lot of uh, from people in the city that we need more rental units. Um, I, I appreciate the 30% question raised by Sam. I look at that and I'm like, yeah, that's, it, it may be 30%, it, it, it doesn't work for me. I'd like to know the actual heights of these buildings and that on, on the high side, both from the street side and from at their highest points, and that the explanation for the strange roofs initially was to accommodate solar, but as is pointed out, they're actually facing the east, and that it seems it has more to do with solar or with stormwater collection, and that, um, that a more traditional looking front-facing pediment, uh, which is very similar in the neighborhood, would be more effective for solar, I would think. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that, um, that the, the quote that um, from the architect that this is a very dense neighborhood kind of got my back up because uh, that the, you know, part of the um, the, the issue going on here and the discomfort for folks in the neighborhood is they don't feel it's that dense. There's lots of people with backyards, there's lots of open space, and that um, this, this is a direction that the, the, um, the, the zoning is going. This is where we are going, but it, it does push up against what uh, people are uh, accustomed to um, I, I would say for, you know, houses, it, I would say the majority of the houses in, in our neighborhood have, have backyards and have space. Maybe 10% are, are like this proposal. So um, anyway, I have lots of information for the neighbors that I can share around stop signs and around uh, requests to DPW to do work on both um, uh, William Street and on Hoyoke Street, um, I, you know, I, I can have a meeting outside of this to sit down with folks and explain that. But so those are my comments for right now. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, Jim, you, you have uh, some other information about general traffic patterns and mitigation that impacts William Street in that neighborhood. I'm sure all of Ward 3 there's situations going on, but you'll meet with folks and kind of explore that those areas that are outside of our planning board purview, really. Right. So that's and and I know that people raised a lot of concerns about traffic and sidewalks and traffic flow and stop signs and those things that that you know Carolyn knows over the last few days have been talking to her and Wayne and Donna to really clarify where traffic mitigation monies go. There's not a direct relationship between traffic mitigation here. Sometimes there is. With city view condos, we got five speed, speed humps. There's other situations where that money went elsewhere and we ended up with Pleasant Street. And um, you know, I, I appreciate the local stuff, but I also appreciate the, the big projects where we have an enormous impact. So I, I wanna talk about all of those things, but I don't think they apl apply right here. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, back to the Van G household for another comment or question. 
Yes, um, I would like to just underline what Mac had said and what all of the neighbors have said about the density issue and about the traffic mitigation. I guess stepping back, what I see is that this development sets a precedent for our neighborhood that I find very frightening. Um, I live on a piece of property that has 30,000 square feet. According to the regulations that I can understand, I could develop 12 units on my property. Um, if you look up and down Henry Street, we could add probably another 125 units on our properties. This is the kind of development that I think ruins a neighborhood. Uh, it doesn't enhance the neighborhood. It may meet City Hall's need for revenue or more housing, but it doesn't take into consideration the people who do live here now and the things that are important to us. And I think that this, this development is precedent setting and will really be a problem for us going forward. Thank you. And let's hear from Anita Sawyer. Um, Will and I are some of the people that moved here not too long ago because we love the neighborhood and we're very, very happy here. We've watched children uh, um, in the neighborhood learn to ride their bikes um, in the street because there's only the only place. There are there are families of all ages. There there, you know, moms with new babies, and um, it's hard enough to walk on the sidewalk with, you know, um, holding the, a, a toddler's hand. But the 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 boys learning to ride their bikes just couldn't happen with the way that um, this is designed and the consequences, which the whole idea of this being a beautiful place for kids to grow up gets uh, compromised. Thank you. And back to the Lefko household. Thanks. <clears throat> Just uh, in response to what Jim said, I mean, I think I sent a map with my letter that showed all the properties on William Street, how many multifamily and apartment buildings there are to just talk about the density. So yeah, it feels actually rural because this is a farming, formerly farming area of the city, but it truly is dense. And I just wanna say in terms of sort of response to Omar and everyone, to how emotional this is. We. I feel like we are in a, a zoning war with the city. We keep trying to win a few battles and it's not that easy because what is in place is, is giving people the invitation to come and do whatever they want on, you know, according to the right, they have the right to do this. So it's in, when a developer goes into the office, it seems rather than say, can you save this property? Can you make it work for people in the neighborhood? Instead, they say, look, maximize it, cover the whole property. And so I guess to the planning board, and I want to say that I want, I want you to be bold about this on some level. I want you to, to just like, um, you know, when people, when gay people couldn't get married, there was a mayor in New Paltz who said he would marry people anyway. And he did, and it changed history. You're kind of bound by these regulations, but you can step outside, I think, and really push back on the planning department. And I'm urging you to do that. Thank you. Okay, let's try to wrap this up. People are going at second and third bites at the apple here is the, but we need to start our deliberations within the board. So um, Sigrid. I'll be quick, but I, I went early on when I thought we were all gonna be super quick. So I just wanted to say, I really, it is emotional and I really appreciate all of the comments uh, that people have made in the neighborhood about the kids. Omar, you know, I think started that off. Um, it, uh, my kids are the, some of the kids who are running up and down the street. It has been so, so important for our family that our kids are able to, you know, walk to their friends' houses. I mean, it's like living in, you know, that great kind of neighborhood that you read about, but it is 
still really scary because of the narrowness of the street and the narrowness of these sidewalks. What Carolyn was saying about having to step off of the street. I mean, this happens all the time when we're walking our kids to school or when our kids are walking now increasingly on their own to school or to the school bus. There are lots of times when they may have to step into the street because of, you know, the snow or what, you know, various things. I mean, there the the seriousness of that piece is it's it's really significant. Another neighbor down the street whose kid was um, uh, in in their driveway with a bike or a skateboard or something actually got hit. You know, they're not badly, but um, you know, I mean, this happens. My dad, when he was standing on the um, on the sidewalk, almost got clipped by a car coming by. It's really narrow. You have to come down this street and actually spend some time here to get a sense for just how narrow we're talking about and just how many kids there are. It's um, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to live, but it it cannot, it, it just can't accommodate more cars. I mean, I would love to have more neighbors. I'm fine with having more neighbors, but it, the cars, it, unless you can, as Claudia is saying, be really bold and come up with like a brilliant new solution. I think, you know, we could make William Street a pedestrian boulevard and find like some radical new way to get rid of the cars. I'm all for it. If you can figure out how to, you know, dramatically re-envision our neighborhood, let's go for it. But it, it's 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 not going to work just to add more cars in the neighborhood. It, it just can't happen. So I really appreciate all of the comments that people have made speaking to that safety issue and especially to the kids. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Carolyn. You're, you're muted, Carolyn. Got it. Sorry. Um, my first shock on William Street was what happened to 30 Williams, and God knows what's going to happen. I mean, it, it looks like a rape. They did take down a beautiful historic tree. There was a big hole full of water, you know, all that backhoeing up to the dike. I mean, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to look at. And, and we, as a community, get no feedback about where that's going. So one of the things I wanted to say is, I feel kind of like what Claudia said, that we're at war with the city, whereas it would be nice to know if there really is a plan for each community and what that plan is going forward and how neighbors can have a voice in participating in that plan, knowing that the city has to do infill and do certain kinds of things. And can there be an advanced sort of back and forth? One of, the, one of the things that makes Northampton valuable and makes people want to come here is that all these different neighborhoods in Northampton have unique characters. It is not a cookie cutter town. It is not one of these boring, you know, it doesn't look like Levittown. And um, I'm afraid the way things are going, that's what's going to be. And, and then in the end, the property values are going to drop because people say that's a boring old town. It's not cute and interesting. Each of these neighborhoods, as you know, has their character and ours has ours. And I don't know if there's some way of having public dialogue about what the thought process is and what, do, do, you, do you get my drift? Yes, thank you, Carolyn. Okay, we, yes. to walk by and see and, that horror show and then have this, it just feels, it really feels like an assault, <coughs> periodically assault. Right, right. Okay. you know, I, right, right. And I, I just wanna let folks know that the planning board Hears from a lot of neighborhoods. Each neighborhood is very unique, whether it's Bay State, Leeds, Ward 3, um, Village Hill, South Street. Every neighborhood is unique. Everybody mm -hmm. really cherishes their neighborhood. We don't argue with that at all. Lola, I'm going to ask you to wrap it up, okay? Uh, but you're muted. And it's going to be short. Um, I just would like to say that I think a lot of these problems that we're talking about, uh, the traffic, 
uh, the, the lack of green space, uh, more permeable land, et cetera, uh, could be resolved by reducing the number of units. Why, why should there be eight units? Why, why does, you know, why do the owners feel like they need to make eight times $400,000 uh, on, on one piece of property? So I, I would, I would love to see it reduced to four units or six units, but you know, eight units is, is ridiculous. Thank, thank you. Okie doke. I think we'll turn it over to the board now. We'll, we'll leave the public hearing open for a while so we can ask the applicant questions and have him respond, him and them respond to things. Um, we, we, again, we have a, 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 quite a pattern here of comments and questions that need to be answered either by the planning board members or the applicant. Um, does anyone in the planning board wanna kind of add any questions before we start chipping away at these? Chris. Yeah, I was just looking through the um, the use the uses in the code here. Um, I'm just curious. I think it says here half scale units uh, don't use any on site fossil fuels. So I was just I just wanted to confirm that this is all going to be electrical heating for this project. Is that correct? The yes. Mr. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions from the board? Well, perhaps we can start with some of the easy hanging, the low hanging fruit, some of the questions that came up. Um, you know, there was a question whether or not they're going to be apartments or condos. The planning board really can't um, dictate one way or the other what a, an owner wants to do in that situation. Uh, but perhaps Mr. Damahamji wants to respond to that. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, you know, we intend to sell these units. Um, you know, things change over time. We may keep a unit or two to rent, but the goal is to sell these out. Thank you. With the understanding then that uh, a condo owner could rent them out and they could become rentals Correct. for a period of time and the neighborhood would see a turnover just as they do now in other rental units. Correct. Uh, Mr. Squires, could you talk to the height of the uh, buildings or perhaps Mr. Roberts wants to do that? Yeah, yeah sure. The, uh, the, the height to, to the midpoint of of the rake or which is the which is the slope of the roof so to the midpoint is 34 feet i believe i believe the height limit is 35 in this zone is that right carolyn 40. it's 55. okay and, and it's measured to the midpoint of the of the roof yes right so so we're so we're 15 feet under the required maximum height There, there were a couple of questions about the open space requirement, and perhaps we could ask the applicant to come back with more specific details on that um, in terms of the measurements, the square footage of the open space and the lot in itself. There was a question about the, uh, the tree planting schedule. Um, and, you know, if that person's still here, there's a specific... <laughs> There's a specific list of trees that the city tree warden provides to the planning board and to applicants that can be used. And uh, it's really pretty current as to the uh, changing climate and what tree species will do well here and which ones they're moving away from. There's also a very specific planting procedure for the trees that is monitored by the tree warden. Um, I believe, and Carolyn, you might have to double check me on that, but. Uh, the developer has, uh, if a tree fails within two years, they have to replace that tree with a similar size caliper. So there's some safeguards there. Um, but yeah, there's let been me, a lot. Let me just clarify that, that for um, the site plan shows the 
trees planted, they, they have to keep those trees in perpetuity. If a tree dies in five years, they need to replace the tree. So that's the site plan is being approved with those trees. So the owners will have to maintain that. Um, the, the jurisdiction for overseeing the planting is um, generally typically the building commissioner and our office. The tree warden's jurisdiction is just for city street trees in the public way. But um, certainly the tree planting guides have a whole list of trees and then, um, you know, land, um, landscaping materials are um, cha have changed over time as the, the zones have shifted up. Um, so those, there are a variety of plants that are probably more suited now to um, Massachusetts than they had been previously. So that's sort of a constantly changing thing. Thank you, Carolyn. The big one, of course, is traffic. I'm not, um, Councillor Matt Nass or Mr. Nass um, has been working with this for quite a while. We, we, uh, the board also heard quite a lot of um, consternation from the neighborhood when the city view condos were built about the cut through traffic. We know that that can be untenable at times, um, but it's not something we can resolve here today. Um, within this project. And this project has shown that it will be incremental impacts to the street. Um, I don't know, there was a suggestion made that uh, having the new driveway be developed directly opposite the Montview exit, the Montview entrance and exit will help to alleviate some of that um, confusion perhaps at that intersection. Um, any other board member or the Carolyn or the developer want to speak to traffic and traffic impacts on the street? Um, I, I would like to clarify. I think it probably makes sense. Though, there were some comments here, but also in the letter submitted about the concern about turning movements and sight distance at Montview and William Street. There is currently a requirement um, or re prohibition of parking within 20 feet of an intersection. So there may be some violations of that that are happening now that are making it difficult for people to make those turns. Um, typically, I, even though there's no signage there, the restriction is um, can still be enforced, although it may be appropriate to have as part of the project, the applicant install the signage exactly where that 20 foot um, offset is um, um, identifiable on the street so that people um, aren't parking in that area that's, un that's unsafe. Um, so that's something that um, could also be part sort of guided for the applicant to sort of think about instead of making a payment into the um, traffic mitigation fund that they actually um, make some improvements beyond uh, just the site um, and include um, that additional signage. There are issues about sidewalk, concerns about sidewalk and the narrow sidewalk as part of this, the applicant is rebuilding the sidewalk in front of this property. They could also extend the length of that reconstruction using um, their required mitigation to sort of expand the and improve, um, make it ADA compliant, make it a little bit wider um, for as far along as that $7,000 would carry it. So that's another option to sort of help with improving the pedestrian safety um, in that, uh, at least in that block. Thank you. Okay. There are some concerns, quite a few concerns about uh, water retention on the site, storm water retention, um, and the current issues that the neighbors are having there. Um, is there anything that the board thinks we can do to Assure the neighbors of that. Other than what 
I think it's important to presented. I think it's important to make clear because it sounds like there's plenty of long-standing issues with water and drainage uh, on the immediate site, and we have all heard uh, of other issues in this part of town. I think it should be made very clear that long-standing issues in the neighborhood will not be solved by this, even if this property does handle the water as it, it's engineered to. It's not going to fix everything in the whole neighborhood. So there will still be problems in the neighborhood with water. You know, the Mill River used to come kind of pretty close to here. So, uh, you know, that's that's something that's not going to be solved by this project, no matter what happens. Um, just to sort of um, address the concerns raised about whether or not there is the capacity to infiltrate water because of uh, question about whether the soils can um, can um, infiltrate. There were test pits done on the site um, to design the system. It wasn't designed until there was um, information about how something like this could be accommodated. However, DPW recommends, and I would suggest it's a, an appropriate condition that uh, precisely where the infiltration system is uh, shown is going to be placed that a test pit be conducted to confirm that the soils are actually what they're assumed to be there and um, once that data is collected if it shows something different then of course the system would have to be redesigned but assuming that the soils are consistent with what the analysis they've already done on the site then the infiltration system um, should work as designed based on that data. Um, but that would be sort of a final check uh, that could be placed in the condition. Just following up on that, Carolyn, um, Jeff, was that submitted anywhere in your information? I mean, I see, I see the test pit report that Chris Chamberlain Perform, but I can't find where the test pit was, and maybe that's DPW's question. Do you have, is that shown on a plan anywhere? It should be in that stormwater report. I don't have that um, handy with me at the moment, but it was dug. It was dug just adjacent, sort of just off the what north uh, northwest corner of the existing house. It was about as far in as we could get a, a machine and and get into the. You know, sort of the back portion of the of the site. So um, that's where that test pit was dug. Oh yeah, I see it now. Thank you. It's on yep. the existing on the catchment map. Right. Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't where it wasn't in the location of the um, basin. It was directly adjacent to it. Yeah. So that was something that we agreed to with DPW. Is we would confirm that once we we're able to get in there. Yeah, I I'm I'm wary because you're right on the, the this. This basin is on the line between the hydrologic soil group B soils and then the B slash D soils, which, what is it? So it would be good to make sure you're on the, mm -hmm. you're in that other uh, soil boundary, if at all possible, because that'll probably be your limiting factor. Absolutely. Okay. No, and we, I mean, we certainly, you know, don't want this to fail any more than anybody else because it's, you know, it doesn't look good for us and, and our firm. So we want this to, to function, um, you know, adequately. Thanks. So I'm certainly not a soil or a stormwater expert, but I wonder if, uh, if the DPW has had enough time to work with the applicant to go through the number of questions that they did have on their report. Um, would it make sense to take a little bit more time to give the DPW and the applicant a chance to uh, really detail some of those answers? That's a question. So to I can just um, respond to that. DPW is, um, has evaluated the application and they're satisfied with it. They just want final construction plans to include the details that were mm -hmm. assumed. And then also, of course, do that final test pit. All of that would be a condition of your permit. It's not a DPW review because this is a site plan under the planning board jurisdiction. So the recommended um, evaluations, if the board felt were appropriate, could be wrapped in um, to the conditions of the permit. But they have um, 
reviewed the plans and sorted that out. So there's no other further questions from their standpoint, except just confirmation soil tests, um, essentially, and then cleaning up the plans to include the, the um, details, not only with the stormwater, but other details throughout the, uh, and the civil plan. Great. And at right. the point, I've sort of put together a list. So at the point that you're maybe interested in looking at potential conditions sort of relating to all of the DPW comments, as well as comments that have come in from um, public um, that you've received, I can certainly put those up on the screen uh, for you to look at. Planning board members, other questions for the applicant or Carolyn? So I, I guess I have a, my, my concern I, um, is not the stormwater because it seems like that's been answered uh, certainly more than I know anything about, but um, I've, I've definitely been in that neighborhood a lot and I, I am a little concerned about the parking situation with eight, eight units and people will definitely have more than one car um and i just i just don't see i i understand um just it just seems incredibly it it, it seems like it, it's just a, a lot a lot of extra cars and i don't see this and i just don't it just seems like it's going to be stepping on a lot of people's feet Thanks, Sam. There was a lot of questions raised about the existing house and uh, uh, the nature of it, whether or not it was uh, reparable. And Carolyn, was there a, uh, a demolition permit taken out on this and a demolition delay, in, you know, enacted for any, did it meet that criteria? No. the. Um... A historic commission determined that um, did not um, take action on it and did not a place of preferably preserved status on the structure. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I, I, we certainly heard people's concerns about uh, the house and how it'd be a wonderful house for a small family. Um, but unfortunately, a small the, the homeowner did not sell it to a small family who was interested in putting that sweat equity into it. It was sold to somebody else. Um, it's hard, very hard in this city to build affordable housing. I think when people say that, they wanna see a house of that nature for $200,000, $240,000. That just doesn't happen anymore. Um, the, uh, the cost of construction, the cost of site preparation doesn't really allow for that. Um, as we've seen in so many other developments, to build affordable housing for people, you really need some subsidies from state, federal, you need to cobble together a lot of funds, becomes very expensive. Um, something like the lumber yard, Live 155, any of those developments that are affordable come at an incredibly expensive square foot price. Um, so this again, is, as we remarked earlier, is a piece of the housing puzzle a project like this that is smaller and perhaps um, a place where somebody can uh, buy a, a house and then move to another neighborhood. Um, and again, the remarks about your neighborhood, um, we've, we certainly appreciate that. Um, many people want to live in a neighborhood like yours. Um, and that's why um, these units will sell probably rather quickly um, because they want to let their kids play in the street. They wanna let them walk to school they wanna be close to downtown. They wanna have neighbors like you. Um, and we, we have to provide those opportunities that we can for young families, for young single people. Um, I wish there was another way to get out affordability for early homeowners like uh, uh, the young man, Ms. Rachevedo, who spoke. Um, we don't have any creative programs like that coming out of the planning board, unfortunately. Um, we wish that we did. Other uh, other questions out there, folks, that uh, 
there was a question about the two of butters and whether or not the applicant had made arrangements around um, fencing or any kind of screening for the abutters on both sides. So Mr. Squire or the, uh, the developer, perhaps you could answer, talk to us about those conversations. Yeah, I mean, those, those uh, comments came to us um, literally in the last couple of weeks. So uh, we have no issues with some of the requests from the abutters. Uh, we just need to come to an agreement how we do it, when we do it. Um, but again, you know, they came too late to our notice and we just couldn't you know meet the timelines for this meeting to make any uh, commitments or adjustments to the plan mm -hmm. but as far as screening goes we are already providing uh, some sort of fencing as well as landscape screening uh, if, if there's a better plan we are open to it for sure so carolyn how do we handle that in terms of marking the final plan with screening um certainly um uh, you know i guess there's two things one is you know we don't require fencing around properties between residential properties so um i think if the abutter is offering i mean if the property if the proponent is offering to put fencing in in a location um and the board um, thinks that's appropriate, um, then you know these plans have to be amended anyway to add details, to add some other um, clarifying um, notes about um, sidewalk location, sidewalk materials. So that could be another thing that gets added to the list of things for the final plan submissions, you know, pre-permitting. Um, so I think if the applicant could um specify to you all verbally where he's proposing to put a, um, a fence to accommodate the neighbor that would be fine um i think that would work in terms of um you being able to resolve that now i guess i should say so that then the final plans would reflect what he's described to you all Yeah, definitely. You know, something we haven't gone through in detail with the abutters yet. Uh, we definitely do not want to, you know, cage the unit. Uh, we want to uh, make it presentable just the way the renderings are. Uh, we are open to some suggestions. We want to keep the beauty aspect of the property as well. But something we can work with the neighbors to come up with an agreeable plan and, you know, get that into the final construction design before before permitting. I guess one thing in the favor of the uh, plan is that we often look at cars headlights at night when they come in and often we put some kind of screening or fencing to make sure they don't go into the abutter's house. But in this situation, the parking lot is far enough in the back of the lot so that those headlights won't sign into Mr. Farrell's home really, but Correct. into the yard. Mr. Farrell mentioned in his letter that he hoped that the uh, homeowners could put up a palisade fence. I'm sure they can have a discussion about whether it's a stockade fence, a palisade fence, or uh, um, you know, a different kind of screening. Okay. Um, the only other issue that I think came up, uh, and it came in a, in a couple of different ways, an early comment was about how zoning happens in the city and zoning ordinances and zoning amendments. And also, uh, I think, how can neighborhoods go about um, preserving, protecting the special qualities of their neighborhood? Um, the first one is a little bit easier question to answer. So that's why I'll throw it to Carolyn. How do zoning <laughs> ordinances and amendments, what's the process in the city, Carolyn? in a short little answer. Well, sort of the bigger picture process is zoning really is an implementation tool of the plan that's adopted by the city. Um, so it, it's not just adopted to achieve um, 
one group or one person's interest, but it really is based on the plan that's been adopted. In this case, the planning board has adopted Sustainable Northampton, City Council has endorsed it. Um, and so there are policies and objectives in that plan um, that guide sort of the zoning. Ultimately, zoning is adopted by City Council. Um, it goes through public hearing processes and planning board hosts a public hearing. Um, and as you know, there's been lots of discussion about housing um, in, um, and the need for housing at sort of all levels. Um, there's affordable housing that you mentioned is attainable housing. And then there's also, I mean, um, subsidized housing. And then there's what we're referring to as attainable housing, which is what this zoning um, is um, targeted to do is sort of meet, create um, options for smaller units. I know this is getting beyond the discussion about how zoning gets changed, but that's how we got here is trying to figure out a, a mechanism to encourage a range of housing that is accessible for people who don't meet the minimum, the maximum income levels for subsidized affordable housing. Um, and so ultimately, you know, there are um, that process for creating those regulations is approved by city council. Um, and if I could just say one more thing about this cost of housing and the size, um, construction costs have um, are substantial now. And um, though $400,000 sounds like a lot for a two bedroom unit, this is not, this is, the, con the cost of construction is three to $400 per square foot, depending, and it's more on a smaller unit, more per square foot for smaller units. I think a lot of the people on the board understand this. They uh, either, you know, related, uh, um, understand the industry. Um, and it's hard for people to grasp that. It actually costs more per square foot for nonprofit developers to build um, affordable housing because they have administrative costs and management of those, all those pots of money um, they come in. But, um, you know, these are, these are costs that aren't um, controlled by the developer necessarily. They're, um, you know, lumber costs and um, other materials costs that go into it. So by allowing for smaller units, um, it create it's it's lower cost for people getting into the market, um, even though the price of that unit seems so much higher than was it was ten years ago, twenty years ago for people buying into the market. And the other option that city does does work on providing a for has a policy for creating and supporting the development of subsidized affordable housing by giving. Um, surplus lots to Habitat for Humanity to build units by supporting funding for Valley CDC and the other nonprofits in the city who are building affordable housing. Thank you. So before we consider closing the public hearing, I, I see that there's perhaps another comment uh, that wants to be made. Um, is that? Yes. yes. Um, yes, yeah, someone who is a neighbor who's not on the call now asked about demolition. Um, it's, it's pretty clear what direction this is going. And um, they wanted to know what the timetable would be for demolition, what protections there would be about, especially high particulate matter um, and such related to demolition. Great, great. Uh, Mr. Squire, you want to talk about best practices in terms of demolition or somebody on your team? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I don't, um, you know, the, the demolition, the building would follow, you know, all the, the applicable codes and, and requirements. Um, you know, if, if there does happen to be asbestos, I know that was something that was talked about, you know, certainly it would have to be removed and in, in accordance with um, state and federal regulations. So, um, you know, that would need to be abated just as with any other, you know, project, um, whether it be window replacement or, you know, building demolition. Um, but yeah, it would all be done in accordance with, you know, all the local and, and state um, 
state regulations and requirements. And oh, I would expect you know what those are. So can you tell us with more detail what we should expect or be watching for? I don't think I don't think that's this is the form for that. Yeah. It's all in the building code. And if if the neighbors have any uh, concerns, they can reach out to the building inspector who then enforces things such as when construction starts on the morning, if if litter and trash is leaving the site, he or she is the enforcement for those kind of things. And they're pretty responsive. I'm going through it right now. I'm going through it right now. It's you have to do a there's a big assessment. Uh, North Northampton requires an a, an, aspe, an asbestos and other another material test. It's sent to a, a national lab. It's completely independent of the company that they are that is doing the demolition, uh, and then that material itself is checked by another independent lab. Um, it's a very long process, and um, you can be assured that uh, it will be safe, whatever happens. All right. Other questions for the applicant or things that we may have missed? Carolyn, you mentioned about going through the uh, uh, possible conditions for us. Maybe we should do that before we have a motion to close the public hearing in case anything needs to be clarified with the applicant's team. Do you want me to do a screen share of sort of draft conditions? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, let me just pull this up. So, um, I'm sorry, let me just get rid of this. Um, so there's prior to construction, a bunch of conditions about installing the tree protection that's shown on site, um, um, developing a draft um, stormwater maintenance plan um, for the system to include um, adequate maintenance schedules for all the systems on site and create um, you know, an annual maintenance check that goes and it gets recorded with the permit. It's different from the kind of maintenance plan that would be uh, required if there were a separate stormwater permit that DPW's jurisdiction is. So um, it's not going to, um, it, it's, it would just be attached to the permit um, um, in this instant or the property, I guess. And it goes along with the with the property owners, it changes hands uh, with the property, a uh, change of hand with the property. Um, again, we talked about test pit being completed prior to um, the start of construction to confirm that the stormwater system will work the way it was designed. Um, final plan should be submitted, stamped by a PE that shows, um, that addresses the comments that, you, that DPW made and uh, come up during the hearing about including final details for um, um, the construction erosion control um, mechanisms and um, entrance tracking pad, extensive erosion control measures, uh, removal of sidewalk, bituminous curb, calling out the water and sewer services, all these details that were identified in by the Department of Public Works. Um, general conditions that runoff shall be maintained on site during construction through sediment and erosion control mechanisms, and they should be checked regularly. Um, and this issue uh, we didn't talk about, but typically a require, there's a requirement for cement concrete sidewalk, which would require granite curbing. Uh, Given that the whole street has bituminous sidewalk, I think it probably makes sense to, instead of creating one little section of cement concrete, that bituminous um, sidewalk 
uh, should be reconstructed to meet ADA um, standards, but backed with a granite curb because that will hold up over time. That holds up with plows and and um, parking and so forth. Um, and then prior to certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall show, we didn't talk about this, but the lighting that's um, in uh, compliance with what they've submitted on the plans and that the applicant shall either make a payment in lieu of traffic mitigation as offered or um, spend the money um, on in the street, either extending sidewalks further for that value, adding signage potentially or other, um, means by which um, it will improve safety in that area. Um, and uh, also the tree replacement fund shall be submitted for the um, gap in what can be planted on site versus um, uh, what they have, that they don't have room to plant. And that's in um, consistent with the zoning and how there can be a combination of uh, planting trees on site or making a payment in lieu of those trees, tree planting. And that's it. And in terms of that last one, the lieu of uh, planting, um, is that a figure that you and the applicant uh, arrive at? A finite figure? So, typical, so there's nine and a half inches that there of uh, trees that they would still owe the city if they plant according to the planting schedule uh, as shown in the plans. Currently, the value of nine and a half inches that we figured, and I've worked with the tree warden with this, the um, figure they're using is $100 per inch. Um, but by the time this project finishes, I don't know if it'll be $100 per inch, but that so, you know, it could go up. Plus the trees and plywood is going up. Yep. <laughs> hey, Carolyn, can I ask that we specify the test pit be conducted within the Limerick uh, silty loam soil boundary? Limerick silt loam, which is the um, HSG B slash D on the drainage report. And is that where the, I mean, is that um, also within the area that they're showing the infiltration? Um, yeah, just because that, that basin um, spans different hydrologic soil groups and all yep. the calculations were assuming HSGB. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious if this, this soil group matches those characteristics or not. So um, the, the test pit be done in the location where it's shown on the map that uh, where the B and D soil or the B and D soils meet. It's one on soil group, line. but it's kind of classified as a B slash D. Uh -huh. So it's kind of unknown. Okay. Um, but it's called sure. Limerick Silt Loam. I mean, that would yep. specify it. I mean, there, I, I don't see a problem with specifying that. Um, um, we obviously need to make sure that it's done in a way that it confirms that the system will work, so. Yep. A couple other quick things. I, I don't remember seeing on the plan a, a spot marked off for snow snow removal purposes, snow storage. Has the applicant thought about that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously limited room on site for, for the larger storm. So they would certainly need, you know, anything that, um, you know, can't be stored on site will, will need to be taken off um, so that it doesn't impact adjacent properties or, or you know, spill over into places that, um, that folks need access to. So that's certainly, certainly a maintenance cost that they're, the, the developers are aware of. You know, I think Carolyn brought up at one point, you know, we certainly hope that uh, not everyone who owns these apartments or these condos has two cars. I think many of them will have bicycles or they will be walkers. Um, Carolyn suggested that perhaps the uh, 
developer put in a covered area for the bicycles. And I think the applicant's response is the folks can carry them down to the basement, which isn't a real practical solution for most people. Um, is there room anywhere around the edges of that building to build a covered portico, any kind of covered spot for bicycles? Yeah, I mean, I think I would defer partially to, to Charles, but you know, the place that we're showing the bike racks in the back of the building is located between a couple of, of windows and conceivably could have a, you know, some sort of shed roof over the top of that, to, you know, provide some shelter, um, certainly. Yeah, it wouldn't be an enclosed shed, but it might just be like a, a bracketed roof overhang yep. for three or four Which bikes. Yeah, which helps for rain or snow. Yep. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to go back to this. This just seems to be too much for this property. I don't see it as realistic. Um, and, um, you know, if, like, if the response is bring a bike into the basement, which seems grossly dangerous to me, um that's like it it just doesn't seem like responsible uh like a responsible comment for a project which is going to have a significant impact on a on the on the, the neighborhood and the community And I mean, as such, I, I mean, I, right now, th this this reminds me of that project that was that we voted against on South Street. That was just too much, and and as as such, like I'm I'm very I'm against it right now, and I don't think um, there. Uh, this is this this is a maxim a maximizing. Uh, of development, which I'm, I'm for, I'm for that, but not at the expense of, of, of the community. And um, I mean, as such, I'm, I will definitely be voting against this project. So Sam, are you suggesting that the applicant could perhaps uh, reduce the footprint to six units in some fashion to provide more green space to provide a playscape for children. What are you suggesting? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm suggest. I'm, that, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. I'm just suggesting that, uh, like right now, uh, this this project. Uh, you know, none of none of these pictures. <clears throat> I would I would love to see uh, some of these pictures with uh, a foot and a half of snow. On them, um, and and to see how that actually works, um, I like to. It's just, it's, uh, it's too much for this tiny tiny space, um, and um, I I just I think they need to go back and and and. Um, and see if they can make it work with uh, fewer units. I mean, that's just me. I mean, board, you know, that's why we're uh, a board, but um, I I think it's, uh, I'm sorry, hold a second. Um, I, I think that this is just too much. Okay, thank you. Responses, other comments by board members. We saw Ms. Lefko's response. I don't think you need to go any further. Um, um, <clears throat> Carolyn? Public hearing is still open, right? Yep. I guess I'd vote to close public comment. Second. So there's a motion to close the public comment, which means we can't really ask the applicant any other questions or hear comments from the public. All right, any discussion? All right.
right. All those in favor of closing the- uh, We're gonna ask them to come back with revised plans. Do we wanna close the public comment? It doesn't, it seems to be going against what you just said, Sam. Uh, I guess that's a good point, you're right. Would that be a separate application? I don't really care. No, they, 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 we don't want them to have to like pay, we, you know. For we would way. ask, we would ask them for a continuance to a, a date in the future if we felt enough of us felt like they needed to resize their plan, it would be a, a, a large ask, but Carolyn. I think you also, yes, I think that you um, would want to determine if the whole board thinks that the plans need to be revised. So that's different from what I was suggesting as potential conditions where they just finalize the details that you already know they don't change the site plans, just adding to that. So those can be reviewed administratively afterward. Um, I just wanna clarify that um, there are many ways obviously to design a project. Um, so I don't know that it's the number, I mean, the number of units are allowed to the extent that they um, can meet all the standards and this, including zoning and technical standards of stormwater and traffic. Um, um they are meeting the parking requirements so even though people might have additional cars um they have met the standard for the number of parking spaces you could also create a project that had eight units in a smaller footprint or a slightly different footprint so i think i would um certainly to, um caution the board to dictate uh, that the number of units is wrong um, that, or that it doesn't fit or that doesn't work based on the number of units um, as opposed to other elements of the site. If there are others that feel as Sam does that it doesn't fit on the site, but keep in mind that there are zoning minimums that need to be met and they're, they've shown to be met. Um, and so um, you can't ask, for example, for more open space when they're meeting the open space requirements. In terms of process though, if, if there are things that we need them to alter and come back, do we need to do a continuance and not close the public hearing now? If you want to see plans and have them come back, then correct. You would need to specify exactly what you want to see and make sure you continue the hearing to a date certain, date and time certain for them to come back. So we need to have our conversation, if we're gonna have a conversation at all right now, that it needs to be with the open. Okay. okay. I withdraw my motion to close public comment. I second your withdrawal. Amen. I don't think we need to vote on that. So George, should we see where we're at? Yeah, it's a, it's an unusual way to do that. We could do a straw vote, uh, Melissa, to see where we're at in terms of the plan presented to us or whether we want to have the developer come back with a, a different design that provides for, uh, Sam, what are you looking for? You're, you're looking for- I'm, I'm just looking for a little bit more leeway in the in the property like maybe one one or two extra parking spaces which can be used for either i guess parking snow just like real life you know someone with a larger car you know just real life situations so that the so that the the neighbor the neighbor uh, the neighbors aren't uh, aren't sort of feeling the whole brunt of this new development. So it's about parking on site versus parking off site, congesting the streets. That's to me what this is about. Yes. Okay. All right. Can I, um, can I ask a quick question? Just. For I'm just curious, Carolyn. So before city council approved this half scale unit um, ordinance, would this have been, they could only fit four um, units on this property? Correct. 
and, and this just unit, passed very recently. Right, last year as an incentive to try to gift smaller units, because otherwise, if you can't, then so you're just going to build out much larger units, which are much more expensive and cost more to the buyer. Um, and again, sort of looking at that parking ratio, um, the parking requirements say you need one parking space per 1,000 square feet of living area, so uh, or up to a maximum of two per dwelling unit. So with a 2,000 square foot single family home, you're only required to have two parking spaces for 1,000 or smaller you know, unit, condo, apartment, whatever, you only were required to have one parking space. We don't require guest parking. And um, uh, so unless there's a reason to have, um, you know, so the board can't stipulate, oh, in this particular case, we don't think this number of parking spaces is enough. You need more because the zoning has already said, here's the threshold. If you think more snow storage is, is appropriate, that's a different you know um, calculation. Um, but it doesn't necessarily snow storage doesn't necessarily have to be impervious either. All right. Yeah. I mean, for my yeah. my own personal where I am for, with the straw vote is you know these are the the zoning regulations that are set out before us, and it doesn't mean that I agree with them at all and i think that this might be you know unintended consequences possibly i mean when you see it on the page it, it, it looks tight i don't disagree but i also uh it, it's what our zoning code says so so i have a hard time voting against it because they're doing everything that we've asked them to do and this is what that looks like and that isn't a planning board issue that's city council writing our, our zoning laws issue. Thanks, Chris. And, and I agree completely with Chris. I think it's unreasonable to ask the applicant to go back and redesign this project based on vagaries. Um, they've met all of the requirements, um, whether we like it or whether the neighbors like it, they have met all the requirements, the things that we typically look at, you know, they put the parking in the back. They, you know, they, they thoughtfully thought it through. A lot of the things that we look at, like shielding the condensing units, um, you know, um, they were providing a lot of uh, outdoor space for folks and a, a lot of uh, a lot of light, a lot of windows. Um, a lot of the things that we typically talk about: um, additional storage, fencing, um, dark sky lights. Um, they've they've done it. And I don't, I don't think, I, I think it is what it is. And it's a tight site and we have tight sites some places. It's my opinion. Thanks, Melissa. Krista, do you feel like we can move forward or do you need more information from the applicant? You're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yep, no, I agree with uh, what Chris and Melissa both said. We are constrained to the rules. I don't think it's our responsibility to decide if somebody can park a suburban big car in a parking lot or not. When you go to look at a house, whether you rent it or you buy it, you look at the conditions around and you decide if it's going to meet your lifestyle. And they're following the rules. So if it's a tight site, if you don't like it, you won't live there. Thank you. How about you, Corinne? Are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Barely. Do you feel um, like I definitely have reservations still. Okay. I, yeah, I just, I, I think that the traffic is a problem regardless. All right. Thank you, David. Um, I mean, I, I share the sort of feeling like, oh, this seems quite different from like the immediate neighbors. Um, but then when I think of like, if we were going to ask them to go off and change something, I'm not quite sure what we would ask them to change. I mean, we just heard a daycare, we just approved a daycare that's going to have 
daily more cars show up and nobody all the neighbors came and said oh it's great you know so is traffic i mean traffic is an issue in this neighborhood but this building is certainly not like going to change it one way it's it's this pass through traffic and, and 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 maybe some speed bumps or something you know i don't know i mean there's this there's the william street school which seems to me to have nine condo units which is like a mix of owner occupied and rentals like a few doors down and should we like be taking those people out of their apartments and saying that should be a single family home? You know, it just doesn't, it seems like this has changed. Change is hard. And uh, I, I don't quite know without being totally arbitrary and capricious what we, we would be asking them to change. You know, it should be purple or no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I have my feelings aesthetically about what it looks like, but I don't think that's how we make the decisions here. So. Um, I I, I do want to be clear. I'm I'm not against. There's nothing that the aesthetic. I mean, perfectly nice nice uh, condo situation. Um, and I think the condos down the street honestly do have more parking and have more space than this. Um, I think that um, that there, you know, when someone this is this is pushing something this is pushing our little community into following a letter of of a law that i don't i i would i would ask all the city councilors when they voted for this thing when they when they changed this if they meant this type of this type of density and my guess is they would all they would say no because they want to get reelected and the notion of putting a bunch of a bunch of new new cars in front of other people's houses is not something that other people like okay all sorry, right I just want, I, I just sorry can i just go on. i, I want to sure. because we have a lot of people listening you know, we've talked a lot about, I totally agree about everything everyone said about sidewalks and the safety and being able to walk down the street. And, you know, I think, I, I think the city is doing a horrible job at that, generally speaking. I wish the planning board could make wave a magic wand and fix that. And we've talked about that in other hearings. I think the, the, the deadly sort of game is that the residents, all, all these infrastructure improvements that we have were all done when we had these like bursts of growth in the 19th century and early 20th century, whatever. And we can't just like wave a magic wand. We're all paying for the maintenance of the infrastructure we already have. We need growth. We need more residents to pay for these things. Otherwise, we'll just never get any of it. And uh, you know, the fact is, it it takes change to make changes. You know. So. Thank you. All right. So we need a motion to close the public hearing. That'll that'll in effect tell us whether or not uh, we have a majority that wants to continue it. If we close the public hearing. You know, we'll close the public hearing and then we'll move on to. Uh, I move uh, to close the public comment. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. I think we've had enough discussion, but because Robert's rules tells me to say it, is there any more discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to a voice vote. Um, we'll start up top with David. Yes. Sam? No. Uh, Chris? Uh, Sam, you made the motion to close it. Well, I have uh, no problem with that. Uh, I vote yes. Okay. Melissa? Yes. All right. Krista? Yes. Uh, let me see. Corinne? Yes. Yes. Uh, and George will vote yes. That's six yes and a no, Carolyn. So the motion passes to close the public hearing. Okay, and now we've uh, we'll need a motion to accept or deny the application. If the motion's made to accept the application, we'll reference the conditions that Carolyn showed us on the uh, just previously on the screen with the addition of the one about the test pit in that location. I think that was about all of the conditions. I move to accept the application for 107 William Street um, per the conditions that Carolyn outlined previously in this meeting. 
Thank you. And is there a second? I second. Second by Krista. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. We've certainly had a lot of discussion tonight. Uh, each one of these is it's never a, it's never a clear shot. Um, so the motion's been made and accepted. Chair just had a little bit of discussion, so we'll go to a voice vote. Um, I think we'll start with David up top again. Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Sam? Sam Taylor, do you want to vote in favor of the motion or? No, no, I'm sorry, no. Okay. That was good. And Chris? Yes. And Krista? Yes. Uh, Corinne? Uh, no. No. All right. And the chair will vote yes. So we have five in favor of the application and two opposed. All right. And there's still more work to be done between the applicant and the DPW and Carolyn, and I think the abutters too. So good luck with that uh, team. <laughs> and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, and good luck with your the project and what may become your new neighbors. Thank you all very right. much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. We Thank have, you. We do have a last item of business. Um, do folks need a little break before we get into this last one or you wanna grit our teeth and go for it? Or grit your bladder, whatever it is. I'm up for going for it. Okay. All right, so I hope there's not a lot of public here for a, a, a public hearing scheduled for 815 to reduce lot frontage and width for the purpose of dedicating open space by the Office of Planning and Sustainability at 1397 Ryan Road, Florence Map ID 35186. Um, Mr. Mikowski, have you been waiting around all night for this? Us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I think the Office of Planning and Sustainability has a, a presentation for us. Hi, uh, Wayne Feiden, Director of Planning and Sustainability. This application is related to a piece of open space the city is trying to purchase. Um, <clears throat> let's put this plan up here if I can. Um, so, um, the city owns the Salmon Hills Conservation Area to the, the west um, and the north of the parcel. Um, we want to, we're hoping to expand that parcel of land. So this is the existing city land, Salmon Hills Greenway, the new Greenway, and then I'm going to show this in, in more detail. So um, <clears throat> the city's basically purchasing this back property and accepting the donation of the front property. And the reason we're structuring this way is there's a zoning provision. So when someone gives us property for permanently projected open space, they can get, in essence, a zoning credit for some of the land they gave us. So the current zoning is they need 161 feet of frontage along the road, um, and they need 110 feet at this narrow section. So that's where they are today, basically rules in effect in 2007. Um, the zoning, if you allow them to reduce the frontage to be 40% of what's otherwise required, then the only requirement, then the, we'd only be required to have 44 feet of width, and we're going to provide more than that. And likewise, the lot width, um, if you do the 40%, they could narrow this down to, uh, this would be required to be 66.55 feet, and we're providing 75 feet. So again, the only purpose is so we can protect this land forever. So you're you're reducing. What are you reducing? It says in your uh, in this postcard here, you're reducing the lot frontage of of the Matusco property. Is that it? That's correct. So this is the Matusco property, um, and they have all this frontage along the road. Um, so currently they have 161 feet. 
so that we can buy the back land, we'd be reducing the frontage um, to 64 feet um, and reducing this rear piece. So Matusos would only own this thinner strip along the road and this thinner strip here, and the city would own sort of that triangular piece. So we're reducing his frontage to allow the open space frontage. I, I guess I'm confused. So the city is purchasing the land to create a greenway, is that it? That's correct, to, to add to the protected land back there. What will it be used for? I, I guess I need an explanation as to what a greenway technically is. Will there be like four wheelers or? No, so it, could I interrupt for one minute? Sure. Uh, the Makovskis, could you let us know where you live? Yeah, um, right. Yeah, that right would be very the, helpful. Yeah, exactly across where you see Burt's Pit Road. Yeah. The point of that island there, we, we live on 909 Ryan Road. We're at the very tip of that island that you see is created by Burt's Pit Extension and Ryan Road. Okay, thank you. So we're, we're concerned about uh, cars parking there maybe, I don't know uh, how much. What will the land be used for? Is there gonna be a motor, uh, uh, four wheelers going up there? Or uh, what's, what's, what'll be restricted and what'll be allowed? And parking? So the, um, the land we're protecting is basically to stay in the same condition. So wooded land, we don't make improvements. We often have a simple earthen trail that goes back. So that's the only thing on the land. Um, we're not planning to allow parking within the property. Um, you know, I, I don't even know the legal status that you can park in the road right of way, but whatever that is, that doesn't change. But uh, we're not building a parking lot. And so Wayne, this is not gonna be a trailhead per se. That's correct. We we have a well. First, when we're buying the land, we sort of need to get a frontage out there. But we have a goal of having as many trail, you know, trails to hit the roads as possible to serve all the all the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and the more trail connections we have, the fewer times cars have to park there because there's just more options for people to go. Will it be connected to the one over on Sylvester Road? Is that that's correct. On the other side of the mountain sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of on the, the west side of Sedesta Road, this land is continuous. Ah, okay. So, the so we already own the land to the west of this up to Sedesta Road and to the north of this some distance. Wow. All righty then. Because hmm. I think there, there are... Oh, we lost you, Mr. Makovsky. Uh, I think they, they do four wheeling up there in the summertime. So will on they, our prop, will they be yeah. able to come this far? No, not in our property. And it, so north of our property, there's certainly four wheeling land we don't own, but they would we don't allow that on our properties. Oh, okay, okay. Will there be any kind of um, sign at the entrance to this property declaring it as a, a greenway? Yes, usually we put a simple sort of four foot by six inch sign. Um, if you want to go down from your house almost to Sylvester Road on, this, on the right, you'll see one of those signs. It doesn't stand out, it's sort of more, you know, announced that people do that. We did that once. Okay. Our daughter, um, 40 some odd years ago, because we've been here 50 years, went hiking with a friend and ended up on Sylvester Road. And we almost called the National Guard to go find them. <laughs> so yes, we know that the two connect and we're well aware that it's nice traveling up there. Our kids have built many forts and things up there. So it's a beautiful piece of property. Thanks. There won't be any, uh, okay. So I was just wondering about parking and vehicles. Traffic, and yeah. How much foot traffic even. And yeah, I mean, it, uh, we, the only place we get a lot of foot traffic are major trailheads. So all these little fingers of conservation areas we have all over the city tend not to get a lot of traffic out there. Is, is, does this con con continue on the opposite side of Ryan Road, conservation property continue? Not directly. We have a right of way across the, the Willard, the old Bill Willard gravel pit fence. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we have a right away there, but not directly across the street from this property. Oh, okay. Well, there used to be a, uh, yeah. there's a dirt road there. Bill Emerson used to own property back there. And I thought at one point that was, it uh, did become conservation property. Not to my knowledge. I'd have to look at a map to make sure that. So I, you certainly know the property better than I do. Well, I, yeah, I know the, the road. I just don't know who owns it now anymore. I thought mm -hmm. it was, it became city property. I'm not sure. Okay. 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 We're just curious. It yep. took two hours to get here, but. <laughs> uh, Wayne, I had an opportunity to drive up that driveway today. It appears that that the residence there is not occupied at all and hasn't been for quite a while, right? And there's a. Which, which residence? At, it, where the sign says 1397. Oh, no, he, no, he's been there for 45 years. Oh, yeah, he lives oh, there. Oh, yeah, he's there. He's there's, 93. Oh, okay. Because there's. That's probably a, why you didn't see a lot of activity. <laughs> Um, but to the left of the driveway, I can't see the contour lines on your map, but it drops off sharply. That's like right. Big depression. Yes. So is right. that the piece that... that? That's the piece. And that's why we would, this would not be a big trailhead with a parking lot. Because, yeah. you know, if you live in the neighborhood, it's great. You could walk there, but it's not the place you're going to come from somewhere else to recreate. This it's all clean areas. fill on that side. So it, it actually... Uh, started a fire a few years mm -hmm. ago. We had the fire department up because it was so much mulch there, compacted, yeah. and it actually started smoking and, and uh -huh. everything. Yeah. Good. So no, he still lives there, and he's going strong. <laughs> Very active, ninety-three Wayne, year old. Wayne, are you planning to combine this with the property to the L-shaped or the Louisiana-shaped property? Yeah. So, but that property has plenty of frontage. Why do you need frontage over here? Because our goal is, nobody wants parking lots in their neighborhood, frankly. And our goal is to have as many fingers as possible to sort of distribute the use and for people to live near, you know, we have an informal metric of we'd like open space within 10 minutes where everybody lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, otherwise they couldn't really get to that property. Right. Okay, good. And then it seems to be maybe two or three sort of long rectangular properties that are still privately held before you get to public land again above the, what correct. I call the Louisiana. Yes, uh, that's exactly correct. There's Tennessee and Kentucky still there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got it. Thank you. You know, listening to the la last couple hours of this, uh, the previous meeting, um, is there a minimum frontage now for uh, for properties for property uh, ownership or home ownership? Uh, minimum yes. requirement on the road? Yeah, different in each neighborhood. It's in, in your neighborhood, it's 175 feet to create a new home, oh, wow. except that everybody who's already has a driveway that, you know, the, so your requirements are less, obviously, because your house has been there for whatever you said, 40 some odd years. No, we, no, yeah, we've well, now been here. I'm, yeah, now I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, but I'm, now, now you got me wondering about how much, property. how much property he's going to have to get, you know, how much road frontage Mr. Matusko will have. Yeah, so he has 64 and a half feet. I, yeah, I wrote it down, 64 and a half. Oh, right. Yeah. So but what about for like resale purposes? God forbid. I mean, I know he's 93 and... and well, um, usually, usually yeah. being next to conservation land adds value because you know the land's never going to be sold. So yeah, so I, I would assume his property is worth more in selling it to us because people won't worry about development in their backyard. Right. Okay. Oh. All right. All right. I was more, I just didn't want flashing lights out there or whatever, you know, <laughs> come here, walk this path. We were in Florida, so we weren't really aware of, I mean, we saw some things going on, you know, uh, surveyors and things, but yeah. we were in Florida and got back to this postcard. And so we were concerned what was, what was going on and how it would affect the neighborhood. Yeah. So our, our property values are going up, you're saying. <laughs> you know, it, look at real estate ads. Okay. And people always advertise for the next open space. You know, a lot of buyers want that. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. Can, you, can I ask you what the, so what's the minimum frontage for this new lot? Or you can just make it. So in you? essence, 
if you give them a reduction, the requirement would be six would be 44 feet, but we're providing 64 and a half. Feet. No, but for the lot for the city's lot. Oh, uh, well, the city's lot, it's somewhat imaginary because it's so it, it's just triangle. So right along the road, it's um, 84 feet that we'd be getting, but there is that pinch point further back. Right, but the city's allowed to have whatever frontage it wants for its property? Yeah, yeah. Or is it because building it's a not house. a buildable lot? Right, so, so the land we're getting would, couldn't be developed. Um, that pinch point is wide enough for people to walk back there, but it wouldn't meet the zoning requirements. So the city's land's protected forever because that's why we buy it. But in addition to that, zoning wouldn't allow that to be developed. Great, thanks. How close to his actual house, I guess, would be the question. Would people be traveling within feet? Um, um, I don't have, I can't scale off my screen, but it looks like it's about 160 feet, 170 feet, somewhere thereabouts. Okay, so they won't be walking through his, yeah. through his living room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Ah. Okay. All right. Hmm. All right. We had questions. I think we, I think we, did we answer them all, Phil? Yeah, I think we're just worried about the traffic and car traffic. Yeah, and, and noise and lights, but it sounds like there isn't going to be any of that. And if there is, we call Wayne. There you go. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And if Wayne's not around, call Carolyn. Okay. So All I right. think we made this easier and shorter than your last one, correct? And much more pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> extremely pleasant. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak, make a comment about this application? Aaron, Deidre, Zoom. All right, has the board had enough information? Any more questions for the applicant? I would move we close the public hearing. Thank you. I second that. Thank you, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on a motion to close the public hearing? All righty, uh, very good. Then we'll go through a voice vote. Um, Krista, why don't we start with you this time? Uh, yes. And Melissa? Yes. And Chris? Yes. David? Yes. Sam? Corinne? Yes. And George says yes. Yeah, yes. So, so there he is. Seven yeses. It's unanimous to close the public hearing. Very good. All Thank right. you. All right. Nice to see you, Mr. Makowski. Very good. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Any questions, any comments, board members, before we make a motion? I don't think there's any conditions for this special permit. It's pretty straightforward. Oh, I have a so are we combining this with an ANR or not? And how what would be the process for that? Thanks, it's Chris. Two votes or one one motion <laughs> to do two things. Um, you have to do, there are two separate votes. I put the A&R up on the screen. It, um, so we have it so you can vote on the one hand to approve the special permit and then vote to endorse the A&R plan um, that's subject of the special permit. Is it two separate voice votes? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I move that we uh, approve the special permit for the project in front of us. Second. second. All right, moved by Chris, and we'll give Melissa the second this time. All right, any discussion on uh, motion? Hearing none, we'll go to a voice vote. Uh, David? Yep. And Chris? Yes. And Krista? Yes. Melissa? Yep. Sam? Yes. Corinne? Yes. All right. And George says yes. So unanimous, Carolyn. We're almost done. Woman, hang in there. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Bye, Wade. Okay. Can we roll right into the uh, motion to uh, endorse the ANR? Sure. 
Can we do that? Okay, yeah. I'll move that we endorse the ANR uh, related to the special permit um, for 1397 Ryan Road. I'll second that. Made and seconded by Krista. Any discussion? All right, and let's hear it. Let's start with Corinne this time. Yes. And Sam? Yes. Krista? Yes. Melissa? Yep. And Chris? Yes. And David? Yes. It's unanimous, like most of our A&Rs. OK. <laughs> well done. Carolyn, is there any other business that needs to come before us? Minutes or? Another A&R. Um, this one is on West Hampton Road. So um, it's actually, um, it straddles the West Hampton, Northampton town line on West Hampton Road. Let me just zoom out a little it's bit the more. Frontier. So you can get the whole picture. Yes. <laughs> it's way out West. There's Buffalo um, out there. <laughs> it's something out there. Um, so there's a piece. Um, um, up here that um, doesn't have the part in in um, in uh, Northampton does not have frontage on West Hampton Road, but this it's connected to West Hampton that goes all the way down to West Hampton Road. So it has it has to go to both West Hampton and Northampton for approval. But this piece here is. Um, going to go to um, be joined with Mineral Hills um, Greenway already owned by the city. So it doesn't matter that it's backland, it doesn't have frontage because it's just gonna be tied into this piece. Um, so that's um, all we need an endorsement for is to um, create this parcel in Northampton and West Hampton can do their own thing in West Hampton. I, I move that we endorse the ANR and do our thing in Northampton and leave the West Hampton people to do their thing in West Hampton. Our customs are strange to us. Yeah. Second. <laughs> any, dis any discussion? So, yeah. So, Carolyn, we are somebody is splitting off this property from a larger piece of property. They, let's say, for example, they own 100 acres and they decided just to give 50 to the city. And we had to right. Okay, it's part of a whole other piece of um, that's going to Kestrel actually, uh -huh. and West Hampton, and then the front where the house is will be a sold off if it hasn't already been sold off for a residential unit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? All right. Before we lose anybody, let's vote. Let's start with David. Yes. Chris. Yes. Krista. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Sam. Yes. Corinne. Yes. And George says yes. Unanimous endorsement of that a and R. I don't have anything else. So we're meeting again in two weeks. Correct. Yes. Regular time, seven o'clock but it's a joint meeting with uh, legislative matters to talk about zoning ordinances. Form-based code for downtown and forts. A public hearing. People will be coming, hopefully. Okay. Yes. Applications that day too, or just the public hearing? Um, let me just confirm. I think it's just the public hearing. Um, yes, it's just the public hearing. Okay, so no joint session on Monday the 14th. Correct. You can so free up your night. Thursday the 24th. Right. At seven. Good. Great. Can't wait. All right. Sam, that was a spooky picture of you mm. there, buddy. You oh. get some background. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 
All right. Motion by David, seconded by Melissa at at 1048. Uh, any discussion? Anybody want to hang out? Okay. Oh. Okay, let's go for this one then. I'll go first. Yes. How about Chris? <laughs> yes. Krista? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Corinne? Yes. Sam? Yes. And David? Yes. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tonight. I know that wasn't an easy one over on William Street. Um,